and welcome to the Nintendo Prime Podcast. As always, I am your host, Nathaniel Rumpeljantz, and I am joined, like I am almost every single time, by Mr. Eric Moore. Hello. And who, who, someone you guys know, he's becoming a bit of a regular on the podcast, streams on weekends besides this past weekend. Sorry. Uh, Actually, (laughs) by the time they hear this, you will have streamed, so anyways. Yeah, uh, that's true. Mr. 5J Gaming. Hey, guys. And you know what's great about uh, this podcast in particular? We're recording it the same day someone told me. Uh, I, I did like a channel update video, which I don't do very often. They don't get a lot of views. It's just kind of for people who give who give a crap. Um, and in the comments, there was a, hey, we need more 5J. So I said, really? don't worry. I'll make sure you get more 5J. He'll be on the podcast. Hey, nice. <laughs> yeah. And I know you said kind of want to be regular, so well, it's working out so far. Of course, we're only recording like once every three weeks. <laughs> right. That, that was really nice of you to make up that fake comment. It's not made up. You can go check it right now. <laughs> Video editor, go to the – I'll give you the information. Go screen cap that comment, throw it up there so they know it's not fake. Yeah, yeah. Or made by an I, alt account. I got to be self-deprecating. I, I gotta <laughs> oh, yeah, obviously. Oh, man. Um, anyways, this is the Nintendo Prime Podcast. Uh, one thing I, I want to bring up from uh, that update, because it, it, there was a, oh, about a good five-minute chunk of it that was just about the podcast. Uh, I'm trying to make this podcast a weekly thing, and I, I'm hoping, I'm praying that this week uh, you guys will notice a massive audio quality improvement. I'm hoping. that Fingers crossed, because we always say this, like last week or two weeks <laughs> ago when we recorded, it was crap. Things hit the fan. And I broke down and bought an actual mixer. Uh, You might be able to see the corner of it in the video, maybe you can't. It's just right over here to my right. Um, And obviously, if I start noticing there's too much peaking or whatever, I can adjust things on the fly and make it easier in post-editing. And we can also tell a hell of a lot easier if it starts doing the chopping thing that screwed it up last week. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Which I I think was because I was using a virtual mixer. And the reason I blame the virtual mixer Mm -hmm. is because every time we adjusted something on the virtual mixer, it never actually made a difference. Yeah, no, it didn't at all. Um, so I'm thinking the virtual mixer uh, has issues with Windows 10, has issues with my hardware. I have no idea. But a physical mixer, so far in all testing, it, it's going well. In fact... Yeah. Sans one port. It sans, yeah, well, we don't know. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. I Further yeah, testing yeah. on that one port. Right, but right. Good thing I bought a mixer that's got enough, to, enough hookups yeah, yeah, that yeah. it should be fine. Uh, it's when we expand to four full people up here. Anyways, if the port ends up having issues, for sure, uh, I'm going to try to... I got it off Amazon. I got it from their warehouse, so it's not technically a brand new unit. And maybe this is why it got returned. Yeah. Um, right. And yeah. Amazon didn't properly test it because they probably don't know how to properly test it. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> anyways, um, why why I'm bringing all this up is because I want this to be a weekly podcast. And based on the viewership numbers, the last two podcasts that we've had, it feels like you guys want it to be a weekly podcast too because you guys are showing up in bigger numbers than even some of my daily videos. Yes, I know I have certain yeah. videos that go to like 30,000, but those are like the exception. Right, our normal videos are between one to three thousand, and I'm seeing podcast videos hit three thousand, hit five thousand. Um, I think a couple have hit nice. seven. And we're actually doing something different this week with the video version. We're going to at- attempt. I'm saying attempt because I don't know how well it's going to perform. Uh, in the past, we've been splitting up the podcast with one segment each day, right? So it gives a lot of focus on the singular topic we're talking about. Um, mm-hmm. But through the feedback I got from the the channel update video, it sounds like people want us to try you know, doing just a single video. So one long, you know, hour and a half, two hour, two and a half hour, however long it is podcast mm-hmm. video. Um, okay. So we're going to do that for this episode. Uh, and we'll see how the numbers pan out. Because obviously the issue you run into uh, doing one long singular podcast is that you can't put all the topics in a title. Right. Um, it's, <laughs> yeah. It's really hard to come up with good titles that fully describe the podcast. In fact, I know for a fact that like the Zelda Informer podcast has seen a dip in numbers at times because they're trying to fit all the topics in a title and it ends up being just one word from each topic and that doesn't attract any eyes. Yeah, right. Um, you might as well go for a humorous title at that point. Yeah, right? Yeah. So it's one of those things where we're going to try it this week. We're going to see what happens. Um, I know there's a lot of people that prefer watching podcasts in this way. And by the way, uh, if we ever do go back to segmented, I, I will let you guys know that watch this video version. We do always have the 100% full audio in the description. We have it available on iTunes. Uh, someone told me I should try to get it up on Google Play, so I'm going to try to get it up on Google Play this upcoming week. No guarantee. Otherwise, if you are on Android, you can download the Podbean app. It's completely free. 
and you can find us on their under Nintendo Prime podcast, and you can get the episodes that way. Also, isn't it available on a certain Patreon site? Yes, it is. So <laughs> that's another thing I talked about in the update, and we're going to bring it up at the beginning of the podcast here, is that uh, I've updated some of the stuff on Patreon. Our Patreon place, patreon.com slash Nintendo Prime, is mostly geared for this particular podcast, for people to support this podcast. Now, it can lead to other video shows, The Boss Man coming back, a second podcast about um, the rest of the gaming world, because I don't know about 5J over there, but I, I pay attention to more than just Nintendo out there. Yeah. Um, so it'd be good at times to, to expand our horizons. And as some people think, uh, that there's been a lot of comments that I don't hold um, other companies to the same standards I hold Nintendo to. It's really weird to hear those comments on a channel that only talks about Nintendo. <laughs> so it's kind of like, yeah. how, how would you know what standards I hold the other companies to? I don't talk about them. This isn't the place for that usually. Uh, but if enough people want it to happen, and it's a really high up the goal. It's something like $3,000 a month. So it would be crazy oh. if we ever got to that. Um, at that point, I, boy, at that, the users have spoken. Yes, they obviously right. really want me to do more. And that might even be on a second channel, so it's separate from Nintendo Prime. I don't know yet. Um but again, uh, I was going to say that or it would be, um, uh, you know, Xbox subprime. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, so there was also a, a, a new tier. So right now for $5 a month on Patreon, you get a full day early access to the audio version of the podcast. Um, so the full length audio, it's not up on Podbean. It's not up on iTunes. It is exclusively on Patreon, uploaded to Patreon uh, for our backers. And I think we have like one or two $5 backers right now. Um, and so if you want that, just that extra long podcast and you want it ASAP, that's the best way to do it. It goes up every Sunday or every Sunday that we have a podcast coming. And that's what sucks about it not being weekly right now is that you don't know if there's going to be a podcast coming. Um, and I apologize for that, but realities are that this is a very time consuming prospect. Uh, today, just setting up the audio equipment with the mixer and doing all the testing, I probably spent at least a good eight or nine hours today, just getting everything set up. Um, and that's just setting up. That doesn't involve the recording process. That doesn't involve, uh, you know, like 5G transferring files and me, me compiling the files and getting them to our editor we hired for this. And if he can't do it, then me turning around and trying to get all the stuff done while I'm still making that video content. And that doesn't include the planning and the coming up with the topics. Uh, there's a lot that goes into this podcast. So yeah, I mean, now that you have it set up, though, hopefully, well, not yeah. I shouldn't have to spend nine hours again right, unless right, I'm completely yeah. changing my setup. Overhauling, yeah. Um, but. It's one of those things where it just it, it's a time consuming thing, and mm -hmm. organizing people to get together besides just me talking about stuff is also more difficult. Uh, and I am willing to put in that effort if I know that there's a high enough demand for the product. And that is why on Patreon.com, our very first stretch goal is just a hundred dollars. We get to a hundred dollars a month. I guarantee you, come hell or high water, no matter how sick I am. Uh, whether Eric can be there or not, whether 5J can be there or not, uh, whatever happens, there will be a podcast. Even if for some reason I can't do it, I will get Eric out, give him the topics, have him try to lead the podcast with whoever else we can get on. Because um, if I happen to be out of town or whatever the case may be. Um, so come hell or high water, if we hit that mark, I will guarantee it happens every week because then I know there's enough people that care. Now, the new tier we added to Patreon is the $20 tier. And I don't know if we're ever going to get anyone to back it, but this was actually someone in the comment section suggested that we add a tier to Patreon that allows our fans to get invited to be on an episode of the podcast. Ooh, yeah. yeah. Now, it should be noted, you, you do need to be able to record your own audio. You need your own, you know, your own camera to record. You know, it could be a webcam. That's fine. Uh, but you need to be able to record your own video and audio, and it needs to be of an okay quality. You don't need that super high-end setup that we have over here. Mm -hmm. Although I would say this is like the bottom end of high-end setup, but <laughs> it doesn't need to be like super high-end. Hey, uh, high it end doesn't even us. need to be with a, like a Blue Yeti mic or anything like that. You know, just so it sounds decent and doesn't have a lot of feedback. Um, and yeah, if you if you're that twenty dollars tier, I will personally invite you to at least one episode per month that you have uh, subscribed for that twenty dollars for. Um, and obviously that can get out of control. We can end up having 20 people that do it. And that's great. If I have 20 people that want to get 20 bucks to be on the podcast, I will figure out a way to make it work. Um, but then obviously I, I will make adjustments. Like listener segments or something like that. What? 
It'd be like a shorter listener segment or something like that. Like, hey, have a five minute spot with us and you can ask us whatever you want live <laughs> on camera. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of lot of ideas I have for the Patreon, but right now, you know, we only have a few backers. One of them was 5J. I don't know if he still backs us. Um, oh, yeah. Absolutely. For the $1. You gotta, you gotta invest in what you believe in. <laughs> for that $1. That's okay. You also, you also chose. $2. Two dollars. Oh, two dollars. Two dollars. I've shortchanged you. I figured I should know each individual sub since there's only like four of them. Um, but no, uh, I just bring that up because that's what's going to make this podcast happen all the time. Uh, and if you would like to be on the podcast again, twenty dollars a month, and I will personally contact you for an episode. Um, and if we get too many, I'll obviously have to restrict it back or even potentially, I hate saying this, raise the price, but I'll keep that twenty dollars tier and just turn it into maybe that's the Q and A tier. Maybe, maybe like once a month you get to do like a Q&A with me and Eric or whatever and just ask us anything you want about Nintendo, about Nintendo Prime, um, about anything. Because it's Q&A, it's whatever you want. Uh, but let's just get right into the podcast. Um, <laughs> right into yeah. it? Yeah, right, right into it. Uh, right into 20 minutes later into yeah, the podcast. Right, it's like 10 minutes yeah. in. Um, <laughs> well, I just wanted to get that out there because I know a lot of people didn't hear yeah. it the first time around. So, right, right. Um, yeah, let's get into uh, what you guys are here for. The Nintendo Prime Podcast. Our first topic this week. I don't know if this is a surprise, but we're talking about third parties on Nintendo Switch again. So let me go down the highlights here just from the last time that we had the podcast about what's happening with third parties on Nintendo Switch. And when I say third parties, I'm, I'm essentially talking about AAA, I'm not talking about B tier or you know indie titles. Um, right. So Virtuous is porting a high profile title. Um, high profile means AAA. Uh, previous titles that they have worked on for ports include the Ezio Collection, Assassin's Creed, uh, Batman Return to Arkham, and Thanks. Final Fantasy Remasters. And this came off of a guy who works there's LinkedIn. He has it listed in his LinkedIn that he's working on a high-profile Switch hmm. port of something. Uh, we don't know we don't know what of, but that gives you the idea. So they work with Square Enix, they work with Ubisoft, um, they work with WB. So you kind of have an idea yeah. that this is going to be a big game, whatever it is. I don't. I mean, I know some people are crossing their fingers. It's like Assassin's Creed Origins or something. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, that's the only game we really know of unless it's a Final Fantasy. Um, you know, didn't Final Fantasy fifteen just come out this year? I think it was, uh, like, November of 2016. Oh, was it? Okay, yeah, it might have been last year. So, yep. again, it could, you know, we don't know what it is. We don't know it's a AAA game. Um, on top of that, uh, before I get into kind of a flip turn on some weird AAA news, uh, Capcom has noted in their financial reports uh, that several Switch version games are in the works, huh. and they yes. phrased, and they and they phrased it as like these are games other other people are getting, so it, it's multi-plat. Um, and Capcom again is a AAA developer, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. Uh, the only game they have out on Switch right now is Ultra Street Fighter Two, but they have Monster Hunter Double Cross coming, and I thought one other game. I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, Ubisoft, we know that they're working with Nintendo on Rabbids Plus. <laughs> I'm sorry, I did that wrong. Mario Plus Rabbids uh, Kingdom Battle. For some reason, I wrote on Rabbids Plus Luigi. Yeah, yeah I saw that. Yeah, Luigi. That? Yeah, <laughs> Luigi. Um, the engine that game uses is Snowdrop. And one of the developers behind the game uh, noted that when they put Snowdrop on, on the Switch, it ran pretty much flawlessly. They barely had to make any adjustments to make it run on Switch, and they were really surprised by this. Nice. Uh, and Snowdrop is the engine that uh, they even note themselves. They used it in the, the most recent game they used it in was South Park, The Fractured Butthole. Um, <laughs> yes. Gotta love South Park. Oh, I know. Uh, and the first game it, it debuted in was The Division. So the reason this is a big deal is because Snowdrop is Ubisoft's new engine as of 2016. And... You, hmm. Assassin's Creed Origins and stuff is built on Anvil, which is their old engine. Uh, but like EA, who came up with Frostbite, this is like over time, all their games will start using Snowdrop instead of using the old Anvil platform uh, because it's apparently a better engine. Just like Frostbite's apparently a better engine. At least that's what EA says. That's what Ubisoft says. And the person who said this even said, like, all of our games are going to be on Snowdrop eventually. So um, the fact that Switch See? supports it really easily. It could potentially doesn't mean anything, but it could potentially be a sign that uh, more of Ubisoft's games, once they're on Snowdrop, could be coming in the future. Yeah. Um, and then I got two weird notes. One of them is the NBA 2K18. Uh, it's still releasing on release day with all the other versions, which I think is September 19th, but only as a digital version. The physical copy has been delayed till fall. 
really weird. So that's kind of like on, on kind of like it's there at launch. The game's obviously ready, but like, hey, we can't give you the physical version. So there's some rumors just, behind that. Yeah, the, co- is cards. there a cartridge shortage? Yeah. I I don't don't know what's going on there. Uh, and it's then, always cartridges that are the problem. Uh, exactly. And then Nintendo. <laughs> <laughs> They're under the bitter flavoring. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Takes too long to apply it. Yes. I gotta put on three coats. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last interesting note. Um, so Rainway, we know it's coming to Switch eventually. I don't think it's gonna arrive on it this year, but uh they'll start rolling out versions of it in November for various platforms. Uh Rainway is a PC streaming app that's coming to Xbox One, PlayStation 4, Switch, and I think mobile devices for some games. Uh the, one of the developers of Rainway posted a video on their Twitter of The Witcher 3 running on Switch through Rainway. Cool. So, proof of concept proven, The Witcher 3, which the Switch most definitely cannot run in its current state, <laughs> running on a PC, you know, God knows what settings, streamed over to the Switch screen. Granted, yep. it's in 720p, blah, 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 but whatever. Impressive stuff. Um, so... Third party, baby. What, what, what are our thoughts on, on the developments that are happening right now? It's all good signs. It is. Except it is. for the NBA thing. What's up yeah, with that? that? Yeah. I, like the game's I'm, ready, but they can't have the physical version at launch? Well, we're kind of seeing weird stuff with physical releases of everything. Like when the Rhyme developer was like, oh, sorry, we're actually going to be the 10 bucks more for the physical version. And then everyone was in an uproar, you know. We're, we're seeing weird stuff like that every time that Nintendo well, bucks the trend and goes cartridge. Well, of cartridges this. are more expensive. Uh, they just right. are. I mean, I know price breakdown show it's actually a lot closer to discs than people think, but it is more expensive. And what we what we have to remember with indie developers at Harder least, to make. what indie mm-hmm. developers are used to just digital only all the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when they make mm-hmm. any move to physical, they suddenly realize, oh heck, it's more expensive to get the game. Wait, or, no. We're making yeah. way less per unit. Yeah. Um, so they're going to adjust the prices. So when people are like, oh, but it doesn't cost that on PlayStation 4. Does PlayStation 4 have a physical version? You know, the, uh, Switch has a physical version of Binding of Isaac. Do other platforms have a physical version? It, they're it, getting one. They, they are, but they don't have it. They didn't have it when the Switch did. Yeah, it, it, it's like that thing where, I don't know what it is, but indie developers have no problem getting physical versions of games out. I, I, it's weird yeah. on Switch. The, the, I mean, maybe that's because they're worried about the... You know, only the 32 gigs of, of internal space. So they're like, hey, Nintendo, we want to do physical so people don't have to store it on the system. But, and the thing is, if they can get cartridges, why can't NBA 2K? Yeah, I don't know. That Especially is... since that game's been yeah. advertised with the platform since the well, very first Switch I'm, debut. I'm, I'm thinking that Indie Game uh, makes like 10,000 cartridges. Not literally, I, well, you know, I'm making these numbers up. Yeah, Versus yeah. NBA 2K, one of, you know, the best selling sports series on other consoles. They're probably expecting huge numbers on physical cartridges. Especially since uh, there are NBA players walking around with switches in their hand in their interviews. I know because I follow NBA offseason. This has been like the greatest NBA offseason so cool. ever. Yeah. It's so insane the number of superstars that have changed teams. Yeah. Because yeah. they're all trying to catch Golden State. It's crazy. <laughs> um, and there's even little rumors out there that my Bucks are trying to get Kyrie Irving, which I hope they don't do because he's not going to resign with us. Yeah. At all. He's yeah. not going to stay in Milwaukee. Um, but. Yeah, it's. I, I just I, I worry uh, that this could signify issues for other third party developers because we have to remember that every third party game that's coming to Switch so far from a triple A perspective are basically ports of old games, except for NBA and FIFA, and uh, the new wrestling game. And the new wrestling game, yeah, WWE Two K eighteen. And for all we know, maybe WWE Two K eighteen is gonna have the same issue. Um, it just hasn't been announced yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Um, it's just really interesting to see that that's a problem. But I think, I think what we're seeing here is, uh, and I've noted this in a couple of videos, just covering this, a couple of these news stories in the past. Third parties, I think, are starting to buy into Switch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I told everyone 2018 was going to be the year. Forget about 2017. 2017 is about showing demand and Nintendo creating a consistent release slate. 2018 mm-hmm. was when you were going to be like, hey, third parties are going to be like, okay, we can't ignore this thing. The few games we have released have sold really, really well. You know, who thought that Ultra Street Fighter 2 was going to almost outsell the combined versions of the other Street Fighter 2s on PlayStation 4 and Xbox One? Who saw that? Really? Coming? Yeah, it almost, I did not see it that. Almost wow. did. Almost. I'm qu- almost. Wasn't but, it like a 40 or $60 game on 40, Switch? 40. Well, it was like Man, 20 and under 
on other platforms. It was, like, it was like 15 on Xbox and $10 on PlayStation 4. Now, before Number everyone one. yells at me, Ultra Street Fighter 2 is technically unique to Nintendo Switch. There is no other Ultra Street Fighter 2 on any other platform. But let's be honest, there's been just like Street Fighter 2 HD Remix and all, of all these games. Street Fighter 2 has just been rehashed over and over and over again. And I get that there is like unique features in this version of Street Fighter 2, especially for Switch. I don't think those yeah, unique features are that great. It's a motion control version. Yeah, I don't think the, I don't think the unique features are that great, but it, it's still a good game because Street Fighter Two is a good game. So right. it, it's like okay, yeah, it's not exactly like the other versions, but it's still Street Fighter Two. So I feel like it's comparable. And those other versions when they came out didn't cost forty dollars at launch. <laughs> so either way, it's like a price gouge compared to other Street Fighter Twos. But again, it sold yeah. like four hundred and fifty thousand copies, maybe even five hundred thousand by now, because so, that you know that was like. A month, you know, a month old data. So it's like, yeah, people bought it, and and I know a lot of people say, oh, well, it's because there's content starved on Switch. I'm like, but like everything is selling. How, how yeah. content? Yeah. Well, how when does that excuse go away that it's people are just buying games because they're content stars? Snipper clips sold well. One two Switch has sold over a million copies, uh, over yeah. two million, I think actually. Uh, Mario Kart Eight Deluxe has almost outsold the original Mario Kart Eight in less than eight weeks. Uh, Breath of the Wild is already still doing record numbers. Uh, it has not become the best selling Zelda game of all time, but there's not enough Switches out there for that. Yeah, I was going to say, is it still um, selling the Switch? <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, no, it's not. Not anymore. The Switch is now at 4.7 million. Uh, Breath of the Wild is around 4 million. Uh, so, okay. so they actually kind of caught up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's good. But that's well, so basically Splatoon. Well, no, that, that was this one. Yeah. And if we think about it, like Splatoon 2 just came out and sold like hotcakes, at least in Japan. We don't have any numbers from North America yet, but in Japan, oh, yeah. holy crud. It sold like 700,000 copies the first week. 100,000 Switches sold, which was every single Switch. And then Switches went up last week, or I'm sorry, earlier this week. There was like 1,000 Switches at an online retailer, and it sold out within something like 90 seconds Mm -hmm. in Japan. Uh, And I guarantee you it probably sold out that fast in the United States as well. Um, It's crazy right now how popular the Switch is. And I feel like this is what third parties have been waiting for. They wanted this momentum, and they wanted to see that it wasn't just Nintendo games doing it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Ultra Street Fighter 2 is doing it. Splatoon 2 is doing it now. Monster Hunter is probably going to be doing that again next month. Um, Skyrim. That'll be very interesting to see how well Skyrim does. There's a lot of people that are like, hey, I'm going to buy Skyrim for the fifth time because it's portable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and and that's got to be the key is that portability is a huge, unique factor. I mean, like you said, it, Street Fighter 2 is everywhere. But how many versions of Street Fighter 2 can you take with you? Yeah. Well, very few. And, and I think, you know, some people, I've seen some people bring up that, uh, yeah, well, that was the reason people should have made Vita, Vita games, right? Third party should have ported their games all to Vita because Vita was like portable home console. And I get it. And I get that you can kind of compare the power differences between the Vita and the PlayStation 4 to the Switch and the PlayStation 4 Pro or whatever. Like, that's fine. If you want to compare right. the power differences that way. But I think Switch provides, uh, one, an easier platform to develop for. Um, so far, every third-party developer that's attempted to make a game on Switch has had nothing but glowing praise for how easy the platform is to make games on. And I think that really helps that it's a Tegra, it's Tegra technology. It, it's been in the market for a little bit. So NVIDIA has had time to perfect it and get driver updates and all that stuff. And mm-hmm. because it's NVIDIA technology, they're providing the tech support and they're providing the tools to develop on it, which is really good for Western developers because mm-hmm. they, have, they don't mm-hmm. have to go through translators to figure stuff out. They can just hop. They literally just call up NVIDIA and get tech support right away. It's and I got to say, stuff. compared to the Vita, the, actually the specs on, on the Switch are amazing. The screen is higher resolution. Yep. It's much bigger. All the buttons are larger. The control sticks yep. are longer and feel more natural. It's a less, you have two sets of triggers. It's a less compromising yeah. package for exactly. home console games. And it can be docked with the TV easily and output to yeah. 1080p. Uh, so it's got all these advantages that the Vita just, the Vita felt like it was too much of a sacrifice going from a PlayStation 3 or PlayStation 4 to a Vita. To, at least to me, it felt like too much of a sacrifice. The buttons were, were just way too small. And I know that's a criticism so with the Switch, but they're, they're even smaller on the Vita. The sticks are impossible to use on the Vita. Whereas yeah, on the Switch, it, so it almost fast. feels like normal thumbsticks. Yeah. yeah. Normal triggers. Right. And, and yes, of course, you, you can, can argue put it the in a stand factor. and actually use a full size controller anyway. Yes, yeah. and you can use a yeah. full size controller. And I'm sure some people found a way to do that with Vita through Bluetooth or something. But uh, the only thing I think the Vita had the advantage on, and it's questionable if, if it's an advantage, is they had 4G LTE internet on some versions of it. Hmm. Um, so you could have internet everywhere. 
uh, which again you well, gotta get through your cell you phone can provider. Your phone. So yeah, so. yeah. I mean, you can't tether your phone with Switch, but you, you have to do that in dock mode. So Cause there's no USB. N no, you can uh, do uh, wireless tethering. Oh, oh yeah, you can. Yeah. You set up as a wireless hub. Yep. I totally did not, that. Not that uh, I would want to ever game over my cell in my card collection. Yeah. Oh God, I would never <laughs> want to game over over my phone's connection like that. Uh, maybe to download games or something. I have unlimited internet in my phone package, so I, I don't have any fear of downloading. I guess if I want to do that. Um, so I think third parties are, well, while the proof is in the pudding, right? We don't know until games get announced, right? Well, this is just a lot of chatter, a lot of positive mm -hmm. chatter. And until chatter becomes something tangible, it's hard. I can't look you in the face, audience, and be like, hey, look, just wait, 2018, we're getting Madden, we're getting FIFA, we're getting Call of Duty, we're getting uh, Red Dead Redemption 2, we're getting this, we're getting that. Um, I, I can't tell you that be because... Right now, it's just companies talking positively. It's not companies giving us something. They're just, you know, like like Capcom. Like, oh yeah, Cap. Like I, I, oh maybe Capcom's gonna start bringing full support. Well, you know, their next game now is Resident Evil Revelations One and Two. That feels like they're tipping their dipping their toe in the water because Resident Evil's or Resident Evil Revelations One came out on 3DS, um, and maybe they are still dipping their toe in the water. But at least this time, when they're dipping the toe, it's a title that hasn't been on Xbox One and PlayStation Four yet. And is coming to it around the same time. Mm -hmm. and I say around because the Switch version is technically coming out a little bit later. Um, again, probably because they made the decision to develop it on Switch a little bit later than they did in Xbox One and PlayStation Four. Uh, so the version of what year? Resident, Resident Evil Revelations. Okay, okay. I wondered if you said it. And they're going to be releasing the uh, Re Revelations Two with it as well. Uh, people can optionally get. So. Did that um, end up on Wii U? I don't remember if no, the second one even got no, to Wii U. No, it never did. The first one yeah, performed seem... really bad on Wii U sales-wise. Um, it's so sad that they didn't put it on 3DS first, like they did with the uh, first Revelations. It was a great 3 3DS game. Well, I figured, one of the best-looking well, 3DS games they made. They ported one over to other platforms and did well over there. It's HD. Yeah. yeah. So I think they wanted. I think they wanted to tap into that PlayStation, Xbox crowd, PC crowd, mm -hmm. etc. Because um, the 3DS one only did okay sales wise, it wasn't great, um, which is why they it ported great. it. it was, which is why they it ported it to a whole bunch of yes. platforms. Right? Yeah, it was crazy. Uh, and what's cool about that version of, of Revelations that they're doing now on Switch is they're going to include like I think they said four different control styles, including the original from 3DS. So people who liked that single control stick controls, it's there if you want to use it. Hmm. See, I bought the special boat for my 3DS when that game came out, and I was mm. using double sticks all the way. Sure, sure. The boat. And double oh, figures. God, gotta love the boat. Um, yeah. That's really good for Monster Hunter, I gotta say. Yeah. Totally. Uh, that's the only reason I even had one for like a month. And then I stopped playing Monster Hunter, so. Yeah. Monster Hunter is like <laughs> eating your life away game. Yes. <sighs> Lots of but I, I love games like that. Just, I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> Supposedly, yeah, I'm still better. playing Breath of the Wild. I was playing with you, but I didn't have that. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's just all around. Third parties, I think, are giving us a reason to be optimistic that they're going to support the Switch starting in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's all good news in my book. Uh, moving on to the second topic. Oops, I moved back to some former products. I'm like, hey, June MPD. I thought we'd already talked about that. Um, so Nintendo has uh, always been known as kind of an E for everyone company, right? Um a lot of times, the reputation is Nintendo makes games for kids. Yep, it's um, a family. It, it's a family, fa it's a family. family thing. They don't make games that appeal to teenagers and adults and blah blah blah. blah. And I made a whole video kind of debunking that notion a little bit. Uh, I mean, I guess it's easier for me to have that opinion. I'm 31 and they're appealing to me. I guess I'm. Right. Uh, are you a kid or a squid? Well, um, yeah, great. <laughs> uh, but uh, what I want to talk about here for a little bit is Nintendo's E for Everyone reputation. Uh, People always argue that it kind of holds Nintendo back. There's a lot of people, like when I mentioned uh, the potential of Grand Theft Auto V on Switch, uh, they would say things like, Nintendo would never allow that game on Switch. <laughs> and it, it, it and the reasoning basically was it because it's rated M for Mature. And it's like, but Nintendo has been letting rated M games on their systems pretty much forever. Remember uh, when there was an exclusive GTA on DS for yeah, a while? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, they actually had <laughs> GTA on their handheld they're obviously going to be fine with it being on Switch. It's one of the best-selling games of all time. 80 million copies have sold of that. Why wouldn't yeah, they want yeah, that on Switch? Right. Um, it's up mm -hmm. to Rockstar to decide they want to do it and they see an audience for it. Um, exactly. You know, and then you got to look at other things like, you know, Zelda has been rated T before. Uh, 
mm-hmm. Breath of the Wild was E10 plus Mario, the Super Mario Odyssey. Uh, this is this is the first time in the history of Mario it's rated E10 plus. It's not just E. I don't know why. We have no idea why. Maybe it's because of the T Rex beats me. <laughs> the T Rex beats me. <laughs> yeah. but, He's scary. But there, yeah, you know, right. it's rated E10 plus. Uh, Skyrim is not rated E for everyone. That's for sure. And Nintendo's all proud of getting that game. So, Bayonetta. Bayonetta 2. Exclusive to Wii U. Here's the thing. Nintendo Am. paid for Bayonetta 2. Paid mm-hmm. for it. I played um, that game recently they, on stream, and my goodness. Yeah, that's very much an M-rated and, game. And you want to talk about <laughs> Nintendo Nintendo being, uh, you know, holding back developers and not allowing these kind of games. Nintendo paid for a Playboy model to dress as Bayonetta at the debut of Bayonetta 2 at Nintendo New York store. Their only store in the world. They paid a Playboy model to dress up as Bayonetta and do sexy poses and take pictures with people. Why weren't we there? Because it's in New York. So? Probably cost us just as much as that LA so? trip. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, Eric. I, I, you know what? You know, we made it at Nintendo Prime. We're not going to hire the Bayonetta model just for you. There you go. <laughs> yes. Well, actually, you know, I have hope because they renamed the Nintendo store. What was it Nintendo... Uh, of New York. Yep. So that makes it sound like, hey, sound like they might do more stores. Nintendo yeah. of Minneapolis, come to Minnesota. Ooh, Nintendo. That'd be nice. uh, yeah, in Mall of America, please. Yeah. That yeah. Would be right. Um, Actually, well, if a mall or th- one of those corner stores goes out, that'd be a perfect place for well, it. They're not going to take over a place that big. Yeah. Well, expensive. Well, Nintendo has the money. That's, right. That's right. Point, but yeah. I don't think over a place that big. Um, so I guess the, the talking point for here is. Uh, why do we think that Nintendo has this reputation of not letting these games on, despite the mountains of evidence that Nintendo has no problem with rated M games or more mature content? Uh, I, oh, go ahead, Eric. I, He's thinking. I, I'm done thinking. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I think largely um, because Nintendo is the front runner, that is kind of the example everyone looks to. And I think based on uh, Mario's history and the type of game that they make for Mario, uh, it just ends up being E rating. You know, it's it's not a particularly violent game. It's a game about skillful platforming and collecting coins and stars. You know, it's not a particularly graphic game. You know, he's not cussing when he falls down a hole or something. <laughs> That'd be hilarious. Uh, it's not blood gushing that, everywhere. That would be hilarious. Right. Right, even though oh, he's ending, of a, yeah. <laughs> ending peaceful Goomba's life all the time. But. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, exactly. They don't they don't gush blood when he steps in their head. You mm-hmm. know. Yeah. So it's that's not the style of game that they they make for Mario, and that's their big mascot. But he is in uh, Smash Brothers Brawl and Melee and um, Wii U, and I believe he, all three of those are rated T. And he's a prominent character they put right on the box. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, they're not completely afraid of it. He's sitting there punching Link in the face or or even Daisy, you know, uh, well, Peach, you know, hitting ladies in the game. So, I mean, they're not they're not scared of, of letting him do something outside of the E zone. It's just that's not the type of games they're making for his court series. Well, and you even have to look at other series they have, right? Right. Yep. You know, like Xenoblade Chronicles. We're getting Xenoblade mm. Chronicles 2. That is not an E game. And the thing is, no. something being rated E doesn't mean that it's aimed at kids. Right. It's just something exactly. that I always try to emphasize when someone's like, oh, ha, 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 who's going to play Breath of the Wild? It's E10+. Plus. It's for 10-year-olds. It's like, have you played Breath right. of the Wild? No, it, it's I'm not saying that 10-year-olds can't older. play it. That's fine. I'm not saying 8-year-olds right. and 5-year-olds can't play it. Of course they can. But right. its target audience is clearly not that age. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I remember and, the whole industry kind of imploding about how amazing Breath of the Wild was. Everyone was talking about it. And look at a lot yep. of the people who are super excited about Super Mario Odyssey. These aren't mm. like five year olds running in the streets all excited <laughs> about Super Mario Odyssey. They might not even be aware right. that it's a it's game. The thirty year olds who are playing uh, exactly. Super Mario sixty four. Yep, that's us. Up. <laughs> exactly. It, it, the, the hype around these games is very clearly in the court of of rating not being what determines the target audience. Rating is basically, the ratings board essentially just looks at what are the worst, you know, words said, it was a cussing in the game. Uh, what are the themes of the game? Like the theme is about killing Nazis as an example. That's yeah. obviously not, not going to be rated f- <laughs> for kids. What? Come on. <laughs> um, but It's with a bubble gun. Come on. Yeah, right? 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, come on. How many how many squids have I killed at this yeah, point? Right? Uh, why yeah. isn't that? Yeah. I'm, I'm ruining marine wildlife here. Yeah. Um, yeah, but no red ink, because that might look like blood. That is very true. Um, that is very good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Whatever. 
Um, what if that? What if we find out that uh, squid's blood is actually green? So we're actually yeah, right, spewing yeah. actual green right. ink all the time. They'd censor it. <laughs> they probably would. <laughs> blur it out. I, I oh, we it decided not to change the color. color. We're just going to blur the texture. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I think squid's color, squid's blood is actually a different color. If I remember right, but I don't remember. I don't either. But I, if something's telling me that it is a slightly different color than red. All I know, but is that Nintendo's games. Just because, no, it doesn't matter what they're rated. Uh, they truly are for everyone. Kids can play Zelda, kids can play this. But, I mean, think about, think about, here's an example where ratings don't matter. Call of Duty is basically an M-rated game all the time. And mm-hmm. what's the reputation Call of Duty has when you go on the online voice chat? It's a bunch of kids screaming yeah. at you in a headset. It, yeah. yeah. T- oh, my god! Telling you a bunch of words that they have no business even knowing right. at their age. Right. Yeah. Um, and... That's a prime example that just because a rating says it's for adults doesn't mean that that is the audience playing it. Now, I, I firmly believe the primary audience for Call of Duty is adults. I think a majority mm-hmm. of players are adults. But it, it's one of those things where kids are still playing it. Mm-hmm. Parents are still buying it for kids. Parents are blatantly ignoring the ratings like they don't even matter. Um, and, oh, there's, yeah. and there's nothing you can really do about that besides just outright saying it's illegal to sell games. Even if parents say it's okay. You know, just like it used to be legal to drink with your parents in Wisconsin, now you can't do it anymore. Um, so laws change, but I don't see them doing it because it's a consumer product that isn't technically harming you. I know yeah, there's studies yeah. out there, violence in video yeah, games, no, and blah, blah, no, blah. Yeah, no. you know how many counter studies there are that prove yes. it's all bunk? It's just, yeah. like, just like there's studies out there. Uh, I was just watching uh, John Oliver made fun of this guy on, uh, I forget his name, on uh on YouTube, who just spews a bunch of con- conspiracy theories nonstop, nonstop has an audience like oh, six that, million that radio host. Week. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't remember his name. Joe either, Rogan. But yeah, him. yeah, Joe. No, I don't oh. know if it was Joe Rogan. It was. I don't remember his name. Okay. Yeah. They kept spewing a bunch of nonsense. He's a six million viewers a, a week through his radio show, and uh, every like it's literally like every three minutes he spends two minutes pubbing up uh, a product on his website for people to buy. You know, and and he's always saying, "Oh, we're just about to go into business," as he's wearing like eighty thousand dollar Rolexes on his hand. It's been proven he lives <laughs> in like a five million dollar mansion. Um, and with lights, we got to do this to keep the lights on around here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, like he's got a doctor around there that uh, that isn't actually a doctor, but he keeps saying, "Well, I'm an MIT alum." And when you ask MIT, they'll say it's not correct to say he's an MIT alum. He went to MIT. Doesn't actually have a full degree from MIT. <laughs> he isn't actually a doctor. Um, nice. And he they lie. Oh, but he also attended classes. You're here, so he's all you know. Just attending classes isn't making an alum. So I'm an alum from Stout. Uh, CVTC, yep. DeVry, yep. <laughs> like, yep. like, everywhere yep. I took a classroom, yep. I'm an alum, apparently. Uh, yep. it's, it's just funny, and this kind of brings back into the gaming aspect where just because a game is labeled as something doesn't mean that's what it's for. Uh, and the ratings board is taking into consideration things that they probably should. They're kind of the same thing they take in consideration for TV ratings. Uh, and unfortunately, video games often get lumped in with how, how, they, how the board looks at uh, with video games. But... When you're playing Mario Odyssey, when you played Galaxy back in the day, Galaxy 2, Super Mario 64, even though you you played it when we were kids, we still have just as much fun with that game today as adults as we did back then. Oh, yeah. Because Mm -hmm. these games are literally made for everyone with a challenge level that entertains adults. Like, you don't have to have super realistic art styles if the concept is great. I mean, Mm -hmm. let's just think about Splatoon 2. We've all played Splatoon 2. Splatoon 2 is fantastic. And the, the thing about that game is... It might feel like, oh, it's got a kiddie art style. The, the single player isn't that difficult. Go ahead and play a multiplayer match and tell me there's no skill in Splatoon 2. <laughs> yeah. Get in fact, th- there are people that, 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 that play it like professionally or get ranked really high that will tell you the skill set in Splatoon 2 is almost just as high, if not higher, than playing Call of Duty competitively. And it's like, yeah, because it, it, it Splatoon, Nintendo has this unique thing where they can appeal – to getting people into something and then offer that serious level of play on top, just like they do with Smash Bros. Mm-hmm. Smash Bros. has that, that general appeal to get people in, but you get into the competitive scene and you tell me it's not just as serious as any other fighter out there. Right. The, the level of skill that, that exists in those games. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I think the reputation Nintendo has is stemmed, one, because they do make car- more cartoony-looking right. games That's in general. Kind of uh, they were just rated as the... Though literally, we're just rated as the number one uh, AAA publisher in terms of 
their average ratings on their games are lowest among all AAA uh-huh. developers. Um, so that kind of backs up the statement, oh, you know, they make kiddie oh. games, but it, it's... Age-appropriate l- rating, not their review score rating. Yeah. For clarification, yeah. everyone. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, that rating. doesn't make sense. Age-appropriate rating. Um, <laughs> Well, yeah. funnily enough, on Wii U, there was a long time where Nintendo actually had the highest average review score of their games for a, a while. I don't know if that's still true anymore, but that was like two years ago. Yeah, um, that was cool. But the, you know, I guess when you don't have a lot of games on the platform, it's easy <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to, well, to, to, to be games, at the yeah. top when you just have like 10 first party Nintendo yeah. games. And I know there's more than 10, oh. good, 10 great games on, on Wii U. Um, but yeah, it's... I, I really think it's a lot of it stems from, you know, even from the early days where you th- you think and you look at all the games that were there in the early days, you know, your, your Legend of Zelda, your Donkey Kong, your Mario, your your, your stuff like that. Your Conqueror's Bad Fur Day. Uh, that, wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't extremely early, but, yeah, but I mean, they have more of the kind Kid of... Kid the, Yes, they have kind of the more... Castlevania, Metroid. The more... Those are the, the, the bigger, bigger things that everybody knows you know, are mainly, you know, in a way, quote unquote, kiddish. Because you got a donkey, you got a, or you got a, sorry, a, an ape. Yeah. A a, Kong. Not a donkey, a Kong. Yep. Yes, you got a Kong. <laughs> sorry. Wow. It's been a long day. <laughs> um, And then you got this plumber dude who's, you know, I mean, he, it, it's not, he's not like ultra realistic. He's like, not? He's not. You know what I'm saying? He's not based He's off like, like a, a man player. He, he taught me how to warp pipe yeah. in real life. I tried <laughs> right. jumping on my sink drain. It didn't work very well. Yeah. He, he's not He's not like, you know, you know what I'm saying? He's yeah, no. not like a Madden player. Where yeah, no. It's, he's ultra realistic. I get I get what you're saying. So it's. Um, I, I think that's kind of where it's kind of all, again, like you were saying, it was all cartoony. It's it's a little bit more, in a way, kid friendly. So yes. that's, that's why I well, think and it's as getting you said, the... Family friendly has kind of always been the reputation, and it's well learned. That doesn't mean every game is that way. You know, like Chronicles, right? Like, about, right. Know, they have examples, and over time, they've made more and more games that are definitely not family friendly, and they funded and, and supported. And I also think a lot of it actually does have to do with the fact that third parties weren't a part of it either, and Nintendo was just make them making their own games themselves, and that's kind of the way it they does. were. Well, we're going. I, I, would, well, I would also kind of say NES that and the, the graphics are, wasn't like that, are very focused on the art. Because yes. even uh, even the Super Super Mario Brothers was uh, groundbreaking for its amazing art style, right? It it blew other games out of the water because they all had these black backgrounds that nobody cared about, you know. And uh, I, I feel that's more the thing. They're always trying to push the envelope. How can we advance the art styles of these games and do something unique? And it, consistently, when you go back, then all the games that were trying to be hyper realistic ten years ago look awful, and all the Nintendo games that were trying to be very art forward look great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with you. I, I think, and I think one thing we have to clarify mm-hmm. here is this reputation that Nintendo is family friendly and kid friendly is not inherently negative. Yeah, no. Um, yeah. There's nothing wrong with being family friendly, but having your content appeal to adults. There, 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 there's literally nothing wrong with that. And there's also nothing wrong, and I'll clarify this as well. If you like the hyper realistic art styles, you like like the Witchers, mm-hmm. you like the Call of Duties, mm-hmm. the Assassin's Creed of the world. There's nothing wrong with that either. And I think mm-hmm. it's the clashing of those two crowds that that see Nintendo's art styles are timeless. Other people think, yeah, but these other art styles remind me more of what I see when I go in my mm-hmm. backyard or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's mm-hmm. fine, and I think both sides of the equation need to learn that people appreciate different things. I'm someone that appreciates all of it. Yes, I love all yep. of it. So it's like I. It's when I hear people complaining from from either side of the spectrum. It's like, why? Why? Just because someone likes something, you don't? Who cares? Then no, you don't have to play it. This is a, this is a consumer product. You just don't have to play it. Yeah. So yeah. who can, Why do you care if someone else plays it? Like when I, you know, I've had people call me, "Oh, you're kind, you're a kid," or I had people tell me, "Oh, I'm surprised you're 31 and you like Nintendo." And it's like, why? Why does it matter? I grew up on Nintendo. Yeah. Of like, course, I like Nintendo. <laughs> like, why does it matter? At all that that I like Nintendo does it make you think less of me because I like Nintendo? It's like <laughs> right, and exactly. it's like well it does make you seem kind of kiddish. I'm like well I'd rather seem kiddish than an immature adult. Yeah, that's for right, sure. Right. <laughs> I've seen what some of those men out there do, and let me tell you, it's pretty high school, middle school ish. Yeah. Stuff. I uh, the drama. It's just uh, anyways. That's the thing though with Nintendo. There there doesn't ever seem to be that kind of drama surrounding it outside of when anita sarkeesian tries to act like 
every Nintendo game ever is sexist for some reason. Um, but that's that's a conversation for a different day. Wow. Uh, she, oh, she is, she's, and I have nothing against her as a person, as a human being, mm-hmm. but she takes things a little to the extreme. Uh, yeah, I, don't I think she does it for like views. I, I I assume that's what she does it for. Um, so moving on to our next topic, we briefly talked about Smash Bros. And something really bad happened in the Smash Bros. tournament community. Uh, so what happened is that organizers of an event um, from seven months ago, uh, an organizer, a beast, it's a fighting game tournament, uh, hasn't paid their winners from seven months ago. Worse than that, um, the beast representative statement uh, to the site that was covering it says that the winnings, unfortunately, cannot be paid. The money intended to go to the prizes has been spent to pay for the unexpectedly high cost of hosting the tournament. The intent was never to make people forget and move on when delaying the information about the prize money because they weren't even forthcoming to the winners that, oh, you're not going to get it. It took them this long to find out. Um, We were concerned for the health of Lolex, who is a person who was managing the money, uh, and chose not to push him too hard since we still needed his cooperation. When pressed about the nature of the concerns about Lolex's health, the Beast rep clarified his mental health. Um, and here's here's the skinny on it. There was fifteen thousand plus dollars in prize money across six tournaments that was not paid out. Uh, Lolex himself, who was managing the money, has a history of actually being bad with money, so like they, they knew ahead of time that this guy's not good with managing money. Um, Adam Armada Lindgren is the one who won the melee bracket, and Ramen Mr. R Delashad is, is was the one who got first in the Smash Four bracket. So this, you know, first off, this sucks. That's yeah. beyond ridiculous. This is the kind of thing that kills the Smash community. Uh, there's not a lot of t- like cash prize Smash tournaments out there because Nintendo doesn't openly support prized Smash tournaments. Mm-hmm. Um, Capcom mm-hmm. and other companies do. They'll even offer to, to pony up for some of these tournaments, like at, like at Evo. They will help pay some of the cash prize. Uh, Nintendo doesn't do that. So all these cash prizes come you know, either from ticket prices or donations that come in, etc. Because uh, Smash is a huge draw. That, that's what's so weird about yeah. why Nintendo doesn't back it is because Smash is one of the biggest draws in in the fighting professional game mm-hmm. uh, issue. And even like Hungrybox, uh, one of the best Smash players in the world, tried making a stand You know, earlier this year uh, after he won a tournament and, and stood on stage and kind of dissed Nintendo uh, because – and it's weird because Hungrybox was on, was on stage with Reggie – at the Nintendo World Championships before E3, just rocking him at Smash. Uh, <laughs> and here he is, like, just a couple years later, and, he, and he's standing up on stage, and he's dissing Nintendo for not supporting the Smash community properly. Yeah. Uh, because what Nintendo, I, I don't think, understands about the serious fighting game tournament stuff is that to be a professional at it, that's what you do for a living. Oh, yeah, for sure. You have to spend... 40, 50, 60, 80 hours a week perfecting the smallest little thing Mm -hmm. to prepare for your opponents. Uh, And I know a lot of people out there might say, oh, you should not be able to game and do that for a living. Uh, You're probably the same people that think I shouldn't be able to do a podcast and do it for a living. Uh, Or talk about gaming (laughs) for a living. And and I, I understand that perspective. I get it because it's hard for you to fathom this new way of someone doing something for a living. But I guarantee these professional gamers work just as hard at their craft as anyone else does at programming, as anyone else does as a cashier, Oh heck, probably even harder work than the cashier because half the cashiers I see don't give a crap. <laughs> right? They're just there to collect a paycheck and go right. home. Whereas these people, like they have to be at the that top five percent in the community if they hope to make any money. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and apparently, even if they are, they don't make money. Yeah, well, and sometimes they do. Be, <laughs> sometimes they do because there are um, sponsorships and and like well, right. You, you'll have yeah. people like buy a whole team and then that whole team. Yeah, and. and that can get interesting too. Like some, you know, a lot of times when that happens, like the team lives in the same house, so like mm-hmm. you're not really even making necessarily a wage you can live off of. Uh, the company cuts able, able to afford it because they kind of group you together to cut costs and everything. But still, whatever. It, it's it's just how the community works, and not every professional is like. Obviously, there are professionals that play like Madden and Call of Duty, and they do make enough to make a living. And they don't have to have their sponsors like put them up in a house or whatever. They can mm-hmm. afford their own place. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Smash community has almost no support from Nintendo other than Nintendo saying, yeah, we like that it's... Like, Nintendo pushed really hard for Smash 4 to to become a tournament game. 
but at the same time, they're not supporting it with any money. Like mm-hmm. you'll see at events like Evo, oh, they will require Evo to put Nintendo's logo on as a sponsor, but Nintendo's not actually giving any money to Evo to do anything with. They're not helping pay for the event to go on. They're not giving any prize money. So like you're sponsoring in that you're just saying you officially are allowing Smash to be there when right. Smash has already been there before without your permission. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so we have this issue now where there's this professional tournament by Under Beast. Where these players are not getting paid. And it's not just Smash. Obviously, this was across six different games. Um, yep, and two, CSGO was one of them. Yep, and, and okay, CSGO is one of them. Uh, and we have two, the, obviously, the two Smash tournament games. And this to me bothers me. One, this company should, you know, Beast uh, should never be allowed to run a tournament again. Uh, Lolex actually, should not be allowed to be involved in a tournament ever again. In, in looking up this story a little more, I think that Beast has disbanded. That, that 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 might be true. What I read in the original report was that they twelve members of their team quit. Yeah. Um, whether or not that means they completely disbanded, I have no idea. Right. But like a huge chunk of their well, team quit, which of course I'm, they probably didn't get paid either. Yeah, right. <laughs> the uh, money got blown. Did. Oh, we don't know what happened. They to got all blown them. up. They, yeah. they said, "Oh, we didn't anticipate the cost of the event." It's funny. Because you um, have to put down the down payment on this stuff ahead say, of time. I'm pretty sure you sent yes. a contract with it. What, what it's going to cost you. You know what the venue is going to cost. Yeah. You might not know they, whatever they charge you for electric. Maybe you don't know the exact electric bill. But they, right. they can the, give you an estimation of people who own the building. I mean, the only other thing I can just think of would be damages that people Oh, cost, damages, but, yeah. yeah. But you, they, should have, they, they should have insurance in place right, to, help, exactly. to help, help with that. Um because a lot of, like, even in Comic-Con stuff, like, they have an insurance company. So if a fan does do something stupid and run through a wall, <laughs> it's not going to destroy Comic-Con. Right. It's going to be just, you know, their insurance premiums go up for the next one, but, you know, they don't have to pay all that damage right. out of pocket. Um, so, yeah, it, it's a very interesting thing to me where this company, maybe they disbanded now, but, like, Lolex it, it was well-known and should never have been involved in touching the money. Um and the fact that they wanted to be careful with him for his mental health. And I can understand mental health is a serious thing. Oh, yeah. If he has mental health issues, why is he managing money? Um, and if he's just mentally ill because he knew this was going to blow up and do a big thing, and the company tried to make the players be hush-hush about, hey, don't say anything publicly about it, mm-hmm. you know, because it's going to ca- cause a rift, and maybe you'll get your money eventually. And now they announced they're not going to get it at all. Um that sucks. Those players put in hundreds and hundreds of hours, dedicate entire weekends, travel costs, yep. uh, hotel stays, yep. you know, all this stuff to go to this tournament. And yes, obviously, a lot of them do that with the understanding. If they don't finish in a certain top ten or top five or top three, they're not going to make any money. But to do that and then not make it make right. your, your winnings after that, when the whole reason you did it was for the winnings. Um, that's not saying you don't enjoy the game, but let's be honest. It was a cash prize. You weren't going there not to win that cash prize. Right. right. You, you could get the best players together in the world if you want to just play in your house if that's all you care about. Mm-hmm. Well, um, and this has got to be grounds for major le- legal action. I mean, seriously. Oh, yeah. You got false there advertising out the wazoo. I mean, there has to be, be. There has yeah. to be a lawsuit. The question is can the players afford to do the lawsuit? Yeah. Also, it is it in, depending on the contract, though, too. Yeah. Is there something in the contract so, that the players sign that says, you know, only get prized uh, after bills are paid or something? Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. And seeing is we don't we don't know yeah. enough. This is just right, what's come right. out about it. And either way, you got to feel bad for the players. Oh, for sure. Uh, yeah. And as I said, this kind of brings up to me at least a larger a larger conversation point with Nintendo because you have this you have them even pushing Splatoon two right. Uh, they they have several times referenced Splatoon two as a competitive multiplayer game uh, that should have serious players. They just did it at E three for crying out loud. They had the, mm-hmm. the best teams that had to qualify mm-hmm. from around the world, and they were just playing for some recognition. They didn't even get free copies of the game. Um, wow. So, like, really? Ninten- well, they, Nintendo's done this. Like, I understand. They did it with ARMS. They did it with Smash. I get it. This You're coming to E3. You're coming to get recognition. You're coming to be in front of millions of people because you literally are being streamed to millions of people to get your yeah. name out there. And, you yeah, know, yeah. whatever. Nintendo probably pays for their travel costs and everything. So, okay. Well, so I'm yeah, sure Nintendo. I'm case, sure. We, we don't know that, yeah, but... Right, right. Nintendo, I'm sure, is ponying up for because they're they're inviting you to come out to E3 for a spectacle that they're going to make money off of. So right. I'm sure Nintendo is is paying for the. But at travel the same cost. point in time, really, you can't just give them a copy of the damn game. Yeah. It, it's 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 not for them. It's probably you not get a belt. Ex- How about a digital expensive. code? Yeah, the digital right, code, yeah. a digital code, exactly. So <laughs> that was really not expensive. Well, they probably got all. They, maybe they all got Nintendo Switches because they're so. Hard. <laughs> maybe <laughs> um, <laughs> their the, their uh, joysticks broke because <laughs> right. they're playing it so but, much. Yeah, but it brings up a larger point. I think where 
Nintendo is a multi-billion dollar company. They have hundreds of millions of dollars, or billions of dollars actually, just sitting in a bank. Um, and I know they have those reserves for a reason. When they have slumps, when they want to make big acquisitions, I get it. I they understand why. The, you know, parks. like it's it, yeah, <laughs> it's actually good to bank up a lot of money. That's why Nintendo. I know that Sony might have more assets or whatever, but Nintendo themselves is actually way more liquid than mm -hmm. Sony is because Nintendo all these years has banked up so much money. Um, like they built a whole brand new headquarters and they still use the old headquarters. They didn't just get rid of that building. They're still using it just for a different purpose. Uh, you know, it's not like Sony where like if they make a new building, they close three more, <laughs> you know, they lay off 5,000 employees because, you know, Sony's had issues with some of their, some of their products. And you look at Nintendo having all this money, would it kill them once a year to throw a million dollars as a, as a grand prize in one of these tournaments? Right. Or a hundred thousand. Well, hundred thousand. I know. I know. What I'm saying, but I mean, you know, basically, just support the community financially somehow. Mm -hmm. Tell your professional players who you are encouraging to exist, right? That let them know that you appreciate what it takes to be at that level. What it takes to be a hungry box. Yeah. And actually, pay them for their their advertisement because this <laughs> is kind of in a way free free advertisement for them because it is they're not it, paying for anything of it and. It's getting mm -hmm. well, and that's why Nintendo. Uh, well, that's there. why a lot of people think Nintendo pushed Smash Four so hard into that competitive community because it's the latest Smash Bros. game. So mm -hmm. of course they want to increase sales of it, not just have people keep playing Melee from the GameCube era. They want the new game to get pub. Uh, right. It, it. I don't know. I think Nintendo. I mean, I, I doubt anyone from Nintendo is listening anymore. I don't have that big platform at Zelda Informer where I knew they were listening because they told me they were listening, but. You guys need to open your wallets to the professional gaming community. If you want to be serious about your games being included, like you keep saying you want to be with Smash, you're saying you want to have them with Splatoon 2, uh, you're probably going to say it with the future games you make. Maybe you maybe you think ARMS should be one of those. Then pony up. You pony up, the community is going to be right. there. You want a, a serious ARMS, you want ARMS at EVO next year, pony up the prize money. Mm -hmm. And it'll be there guaranteed. EVO will have no problem mm -hmm. including because then you're really a sponsor. And right. you will have professional level players who over the next year hone their skills. And it's funny because they're honing their skills for a chance at a prize. They're not getting paid along the way right. unless they have a sponsor. So, <laughs> like Nintendo, we're not asking you to pay these guys' wages. We're saying offer some prize money at some of these tournaments. Mm -hmm. You can afford to do it. It's not going to hurt your bottom line. And it's going to make headlines, mm -hmm. positive headlines for you. Yeah. Oh, Nintendo at well, four tournaments a year pulls up ponies up $100,000 for the top three players in, you know, the Smash, Splatoon, and whatever. So you probably have $400,000, $500,000 for three different tournaments a year, $1.5 million. And you're going to have headlines every single time that's going to make people be like, holy crap, Nintendo believes in this one. Maybe I should become a professional Splatoon player. Well, even if they don't go with all the tournaments that are out there, established tournaments, yeah. they could have their own Nintendo-focused esports sort of channel like how they have a giant Pokemon event every year. They could, yeah. Um, focused on the card game and the video games, you know. Uh, yeah. They could do that with, Nintendo, oh, uh, they put Pokemon Tournament in there. I their own that. Nintendo World Championships that actually has legit prize stuff behind it. Not right. what they did at E3, like legit championships where you're like going the to get the, you're going to get the best players to show up because you are offering something that they care about. Uh, because mm -hmm. a lot of these players be like, it doesn't matter how often I get on TV if I don't make any of the money from the TV. <laughs> well, they did yeah. have one interesting idea from that sort of reboot of the Nintendo World Championship, sure. which was what? You played a, a special challenge round out of NES Remix on 3DS, um... and they got the people with the best ranks out of that. Yep. That's a great idea yeah. to get a yeah. tournament together. Put mm -hmm. more of that in your games. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. I think... I feel bad for these players. Uh, I know professional gaming is always a controversial thing, and a lot of professional gamers do live streams and stuff, so they make money on, on Twitch and everything um, because a lot of people want to show up to see, okay, how, what's a pro really play like? Like, how awesome are they? But yeah. a lot of those <laughs> games are like League of Legends and, and right. other games oh, yeah. that are built for PC. Yep. Melee obviously doesn't have a, a glowing... Uh, online streaming Smash community because it's a GameCube <laughs> game. Yeah. Um, yeah. And online for Smash Bros. 4 is not unplayable at a professional level. Um, so you're not going to oh. see professional level Smash 4 players generally streaming, uh, oh, making right. revenue that yeah. way as, yeah. they're, as they're practicing. Yeah. But you will see like professional League of Legends players, professional Hearthstone players, professional players of these games 
will have streaming channels. And for those players, I don't necessarily feel as bad because they do have the ability to make an mm-hmm. income playing the game at a professional level because mm-hmm. that's why people are watching them. Whereas these players for Nintendo, outside of Splatoon 2 now, which I, I don't know how well the online service works for professional level play because now we just found out that Splatoon 2, um, in terms of how often it's transmitting data, now does it 30% slower than the original Splatoon did uh, in online matches. So I don't know if that perfect uh, if that's really affecting professional players at, at all. Um, I'm sure mm-hmm. it is. Um, you know, th- again, I can't verify any of this because I don't I don't play at that that level and have the tech to to right. examine this. Uh-huh. But you know, apparently it's not an issue in local play, which obviously that's what most professional tournaments would be at is local play. You're not going to do it over a Wi-Fi right. network. Right. But uh, yeah, it's it, it's something I just hope Nintendo wakes up one day and decides they want to care about. Because that's all it has to be. It's not, they can't afford it. It would be a blip on their financial report. Right. And the thing is, too, is, let's look at it this way. How terrible is the publicity for Nintendo, even though they're not involved? This looks so bad, even on Nintendo, just because their name is associated with the game that's not... I mean, this this made headlines because of Smash. Right. Yes, there are other games involved, but notice that it was Smash that made it make headlines. Mm-hmm. And it, you just said CS:GO was one of the CS:GO yeah. is infinitely more popular. Right, and I didn't mean I did see I did see a, a an article on that a couple. I know, like, but like but the articles ago, but yeah. and obviously the articles bring to my attention are Nintendo related. Well, right, but like right, this but, was on Compete, this was on Kotaku, all of them yep. leading with Smash, 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 yep. and it's like that's because Smash is a big deal. But like I was saying, if Nintendo would just pony up and and actually support this you wouldn't have this yeah and here's the thing we're talking about forget a hundred thousand dollars like those crazy numbers yeah this was fifteen thousand dollars spread over six games okay so you're telling me nintendo could have thrown in a few thousand Mm -hmm. to support the two smash games Mm -hmm. right because we're we're not looking at the super high price like i was getting a little crazy with my numbers a little bit but i mean just supporting these tournaments in a little way, and not every single tournament, and obviously not tournaments that have someone like Lolex involved, which has a bad reputation. Um, and obviously any tournament they submit financials to, you better know that Nintendo's watching like a Hawkeye to make sure that money goes to oh, where yeah. it's supposed to. Yeah. Um, because Nintendo doesn't want the bad publicity. Oh, we we gave money to an event for prizes, and the players didn't get the money we gave them? Oh, Nintendo's yeah. going to come after you then, and right. that tournament's right. probably never going to exist right. again, because they're going to rape right. you with their lawyers from Right, right. Um, and it's, it's just to me, it's just terrible publicity for them, even though they're not involved. It's, it's, it's not that Nintendo's guilty. Nintendo's not at fault for this, but it's no, it, it's, it's more so by association. Yep, they're getting blamed let's, for it. Let's, I mean, I don't think they're getting blamed, but it brings to light... Uh, think about this. Think about what this topic became. It went from, here's this terrible company that did a terrible thing uh, with a known person that everyone knew is terrible with money and they didn't foresee the issues with this ahead of time like they should have or maybe they didn't thought they addressed it but they obviously clearly didn't Mm -hmm. and it's turned into a conversation about how nintendo needs to do more and it's not because we blame nintendo for what happened here but it highlights the fact that competitive gaming doesn't have a lot of money in these prizes and it wouldn't be hard for Nintendo to be like a Capcom and give money to some of these tournaments, mm-hmm. f- specifically mm-hmm. for the prizes. Mm-hmm. And even if not for the prizes, say say the prize money is going to still be based on ticket sales, so there's not like, oh, like Smash Bros. has a $50,000 grand prize, while Street Fighter V has you know, a $1,000 grand prize. Because you don't want to skew you know the gamers, maybe. But even if it's like, look, Nintendo won't give you money directly for the prizes. They'll let you base that off of the ticket sales. But Nintendo will provide money to help pay for the event to happen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that frees up more of that money for prizes and they can spread that out. And that would even show support for Nintendo for the whole community. Now, I think Nintendo would probably go individual game bases personally. But it, it's – it's Nintendo – It it's I feel bad for these gamers. But I feel like this is just another opportunity to put Nintendo um, – in front of us and say, hey, you should start supporting the community you keep saying you like. Mm-hmm. You are For years, they shunned it. Fine. Don't give any money. You don't think Smash should be a competitive game. Blah, 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 blah. Now you're openly throwing... Now you're openly putting Splatoon 2 uh, in a fake Evo setting during an ad. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. If you want it to be there, pony up. <laughs> yeah, right? Pony up and people will show up. You are putting competitive arms and competitive... 
uh, Splatoon 2 in front of your audience at E3, both in person and and you're seeing the crowd reactions yep. to it. You see how popular this is. Pony up, start supporting mm-hmm. that professional community. Um, anyways, that that's just kind of my rant for that. I, I just think All Nintendo right. needs to, while this isn't Nintendo's fault, Nintendo needs to start stepping up and helping these these organizations or these players be able to do this at a professional level by showing that they care. And I think, think when Hungrybox took that stance, that's all he was asking for. Nintendo, it could be as little as $50,000 a year Nintendo gives to various tournaments. Mm-hmm. Whatever, whatever it is, it shows that Nintendo is serious about supporting their communities. Instead of doing mm-hmm. this pseudo, we're going to act like we care about the communities, but when it comes to giving money, yeah, no. we, don't, we don't care. We want you to play professionally and have your own full-time job on top of that. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. You know, we want you to support your family, but also become a professional player at the same time. Now, to me, it seems like maybe they just don't realize the financial potential of it. Uh, they maybe don't see how, how much esports is growing and how make. it could be great for them to jump on board with that. Think about They're the very money popular they games. could make off sponsorships alone if Nintendo would just do their own worldwide Nintendo World Championships tournament mm-hmm. every year. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, they offered cash prizes, which would already draw huge numbers of professional players mm-hmm. to these games. Uh, and they could even partner up. They could have Ultra Street Fighter 2 in this tournament because it's on Switch. They, they could mm-hmm. have third-party games. They might even attract third-party games because they're going to want to get their games in front yep. of the Nintendo World audience. And Nintendo streaming this on all of their channels and getting, you know... You, you get Nyko in there. You you know you get all these accessory yep. makers sponsoring, paying Nintendo money to have their products yep. featured during the stream. Yep. Like Nintendo could actually make money, make more money off sponsorships than they pay out to have this tournament happen and make players happy. Nintendo makes money, draws huge attention, and I know it's it's a big event to organize. You can't tell me Nintendo can't organize big events. They do it all the time. Not to the maybe not to this level, but come on, if they could do this back in the day with Nintendo World Championships, mm-hmm. they can do it today. Mm-hmm. And exactly. not just as as a the the last time they did Nintendo World Championships felt more like a glorified version of it. It it wasn't a true Nintendo World Championships. It didn't have the flavor. It didn't have simplified, the sold out audience. Think, not glorified. They're, they're, well, simplified, whatever. They they didn't have <laughs> they didn't have all the glamour with it. They can do that now. They can offer money. They can pony up, get sponsors. They can talk to uh, people. You know, people that do all these big live streams like Evo. Figure it all out. Uh, Nintendo can do it. They have the ability. Mm-hmm. They have they have to have the desire to do it because this is another chance for Nintendo to make money while making the community happy. Well, and, and, and increasing. And we just talked about in our last topic about Nintendo. You know, has this kid friendly thing. Well, offering prize money, running a professional grade tournament live to millions yeah. of people. Yeah. They could even strike a TV deal. I guarantee you, after one year, there's going to be a TV company. Oh, yeah. ESPN or Disney will call like, dude, can we be your exclusive TV uh-huh. provider for this? Right. <laughs> you know what kind of contract that's going to be? Right. It won't be NFL, NBA kind of contract, but you know, Disney would gladly probably give them you know, $50 million to be the exclusive and, and holder of a what? tournament with millions of viewers. And guess Netflix? what? Netflix? Probably hosted oh. at Disney World. <laughs> you, they, could par- probably... they could partner with YouTube even for yeah. streaming? Oh. Yeah. Twitch. And, and, oh, well, is an Amazon company Disney now, so might Twitch not do it. Big money. I just remember because they have the Universal Parks. Maybe Disney doesn't want conflicts with Universal. Right. Um, so yeah, maybe it'd be a Universal partner company. Still, either way, you, could, you could host it at Universal Studios. Oh. You could host it. You could. That's the thing. Oh. Like Nintendo is set, like Nintendo. We're giving you the ideas. Yeah, you need right. to take this. And and the thing is really? too is that if you can draw the other the other games in too with this, I mean you could have. I mean, just crazy amounts of sponsors because if you limit it to, you get to sponsor one game. Well, guess what? For that one game, well, they get all the chairs or they get all the headsets. They get all this. They get all that. But guess what? The next game or the next, yeah, the next game, they're going to have completely new ones. Yeah. And think about this. This is another thing to think about because this happens already with like Evo and stuff. Uh, Because this would be Nintendo only, there's another way everyone else that for these games makes money. Every game that shows up on the floor while the tournaments are going on uh, is 20% off on the eShop yeah. for all viewers. Mm. Yeah. Because that yes. already happens with Steam. With a, with a coat. With a, a, lo- yeah. a lot of like legal, like a lot of games that get competitive on Steam, there's discounts mm-hmm. when all these events are going on. Mm-hmm. Nintendo well, can Twitch easily does do that. a thing on. where if you're streaming a game and somebody buys it while watching your stream, you get a cut. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like there's a, there's a, a you know, Nintendo can increase sales, can increase awareness. That I mean, this is, this is something that would be uniquely Nintendo because they already have between ARMS, 
Smash, Splatoon. They, they have three games right there they can use the headline mm-hmm. competitive Pokemon multiplayer. Tournament. Pokemon, tur- Pokemon, Pokemon Tournament games. as well, if you want to throw Pokemon Tournament in there. Uh, I'm sure they can come up with other games too. Yeah, you could probably get Street Fighter in there. That, that can guarantee you can get yeah. Mario, Kart. Yeah. Mario Kart. Mario too. Kart too. You can yeah. have ser- I mean, ser- can you imagine serious Mario Kart? I mean, they could have even two different versions with items and without items. Yeah. I'm thinking no items, 200 CC is the pro <laughs> level. <laughs> probably, Prob- <laughs> probably, probably, probably. Uh, but it, it, it's just there's so much amazing. potential. The, they have this potential. Mm-hmm. They have enough of these games now with the introduction of Splatoon now and ARMS. They could do this all on their own, and everyone else would be jealous and want in. Mm-hmm. Um, and Nintendo could literally start to own the fighting game community just off one event a year because of the amount of attention it draws, the amount of sponsorship deals. There's going to you know, think about, I talked about before how some teams get sponsorships. You don't think they're going to want to sponsor a team that's going to be in front of multiple millions mm-hmm. of people guaranteed at Universal Parks? In, in front of you know crowds of crowds of potentially millions that are there for, for that event or they're just as tourists and are like what's going on why is this whole Nintendo section quartered off for for this big event what's going on we gotta go check that out so Nintendo's gonna sell more merch in there they're gonna have game sales like it is crazy Nintendo we're giving you these ideas the thing is these ideas have happened in the past with the fighting game community yeah just never been collectively put in the one spot and now Nintendo's kind of set up to do it yeah especially now I mean when you brought up Universal it's like yeah, dude, they, they literally own entire sections of the Universal Park. Yeah, why that? They are perfectly That's set up to do this thing. Yeah. Holy crud! Why would they not? Um, anyways, uh, at, at least to me, this feels like a time for us to be talking about that instead of focusing on the negative uh, beast and everything. Not not being able to pay uh, these competitive right. players who rely on this money. It's a perfect time to be like, look, there's a better way that this all could be done, and Nintendo has the ability to do it. So Nintendo, do it. In fact, I'm gonna go on my, uh, my Nintendo Switch online app right after this and feedback. I want you to hey, host Nintendo this. World Championships. Watch this. Here's watch this a video. podcast with all watch the ideas. Watch this video. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh hey, god. Don't you, have, don't you? I have. I, have I do have the one content, but he, he technically works at their PR company. But. It, uh, I'll just ship That's him exactly the, who you need to talk to. I'll, I'll ship him their the, PR. I'll ship I mean, him. Seriously. I'll ship him the podcast and be like, "Hey, pass this on." Someone, yeah. make sure someone. It doesn't have to be Reggie. Just make sure someone sees it and yeah, uh, you'll watch it yourself if you think it's a good idea. We'll take a spell cut though. <laughs> By the way, yeah, we're okay. trademarking this idea, yes, of Nintendo. Yes. So yeah. even though we have no rights to any of this stuff, <laughs> right, right, and I'm, you could literally shut down our channel for having Nintendo in it. Um, I'm trademarking this idea. I yes. want. I want a two trademarking per- Universal a one per- Studios, a half percent Mario cut, Kart, yeah, half percent cut of, of any revenue <laughs> off of this, this is a World Championship event that I own no rights to. You're right. Um. Anyways, <laughs> seriously, I I think that's probably been our best conversation we've had so far in this podcast. Yeah. Because it's yeah. so, it's right there for the table. It is. It is. So yeah. ripe. Uh. So the last thing I want to talk about is actually inspired by another YouTuber, Arlo, our good friend Arlo. The Talking Blue Puppet. Um, he, he's got a, a nice channel. If you haven't heard of him, I'll put a link down to his video since this topic is complete, completely inspired by him. Uh, we're going to talk about a little Zelda quick here for our final topic of the day. And specifically, we're talking about uh, how would you make console Zelda games release at a faster rate? Because Zelda games in general release all the time. But right. there's been a trend of the last two games. It took five years. And only twice has it taken less time, and that was with Majora's Mask and The Wind Waker. All other games have had, well, I guess Twilight Princess technically, but um, I'm thinking how many consoles have this, more than one? Like Zelda One, Zelda Two, Zelda. and then the space between Zelda Two and A Link to the Past was huge. The, the gap between A Link to the Past, Ocarina of Time was huge, uh, and then Majora's Mask, The Wind Waker, and Twilight Princess all came up pretty quick. And then Twilight Princess Discovered Sword was huge. Discovered Sword of Breath of the Wild was huge. So uh, it's, I guess it's almost been 50-50, but a lot of the – it's been almost it's been almost two decades since that came out that quickly because of how long it's been taking for the recent games. Uh-huh. So I'm going to pose this question first to 5J. So how, okay. how would you fix um, the rate of release of console Zelda games to be, come out faster? Well, I mean, obviously, uh, one of the ways that they can do that is going with another company to help develop. Like when they made 
uh, when they had Capcom make uh, Oracle of Ages and Oracle of Seasons on Game Boy Color. Some amazing top-down Zelda games. Excellent. Um, and then, of course, when they're combining their portable and console divisions together, hey, now we get all the 3DS mainline Zelda games in addition to all the 3D mainline Zelda games all on the same platform. So those are going to help. Uh, I also say that I'd like to see more things that were like uh, Majora's Mask, where it took the engine and everything of uh, Ocarina of Time, and they even reused a lot of it, you know, characters and everything. They gave them new names and pretended that they weren't <laughs> the exact same models from the previous game. That was pretty And hilarious. they made something amazing out of it. And they took longer than they intended to to make it, which is fine. But uh, they made it something awesome. It was like a real sequel, which we don't see a lot of That's in uh, the Zelda series. And I, and I think going for that kind of approach of making more sequels and reusing an engine instead of reinventing the art style every time, mm. these are all things that would help a lot. <laughs> mm. You got any ideas, Eric? Yeah, and I, I'm going to kind of follow along those same lines where I don't, as much as I don't know if I would like it, it would almost be more of a, a thing that can get things out quick, more quickly, to be a, like an actual DLC. Mm, okay. So where you know you have your world built, and then you have a new concept that just get, gets introduced into this world. You know, so you don't have to spend the time building your worlds. So you don't have to spend your time doing this, doing that. You build your concept, and you introduce it into that world. As much as I, as much as I'm not a big fan of DLC, mm -hmm. it, it seems like that could get out a heck of a lot quicker than actually full full games. I'm into this if it's. We grow up with PC games and expansion packs, um, and if it's of a certain expansion pack level, like I feel like we don't know what level the story DLC is going to be at. Uh, we don't, you know, we've heard one dungeon. We've heard, you know new story about Zelda and the champions and stuff. That's great. That That's fine. That all sounds cool. There'll probably be some more shrines, but we don't know how much more content. Are we talking two hours? Are we talking six? Are we talking 10? Are we talking another hundred hours? Right. Considering uh, the four dungeons of breath of the wild, is it literally 25% more game? Yeah. So we don't know. <laughs> we don't know what this entails yet to know if it's of that level, but for DLC after that, it, it's, it almost would have to top whatever that is, anyways. Um, right. it, it couldn't be another another type of master mode, and and, and, con and it would have to be something significant. And, and we've seen in Breath of the Wild, there's technically room because if you go to the edge of the map where the river is, you, there's land yep. beyond that. That yeah. they could easily. I mean, I don't know how easy it is for them, but they could add that land into easy. the game and then have you know more you know a whole new area to play in. Mm -hmm. And maybe they're going to do that in this DLC. We don't know, but. It's interesting to me uh, that you bring that up because I was torn on this because on one hand, I want a Majora's Mask again. Mm -hmm. And Majora's Mask, I don't think happens if they were just building onto the world of Ocarina of Time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we're in, yeah. we're in a new era of gaming where DLC is very common. And if you're going to use the same engine and you're going to build a world, that, a world and a story and a game that takes place ap like immediately after Breath of the Wild, it almost does make more sense as dlc uh but then again i keep thinking back to majora's mask DLC too, in a way. well i know but but yeah. but i don't view it, majora's mask is not viewed as dlc at all right because mm -hmm. whole new world mm -hmm. alternate mm -hmm. dimension yes you could do that as dlc obviously like world of warcraft does that kind of dlc all right. the time right but it it's still one of those things that it holds itself so well because it's such a self-contained game it's not it's built with Ocarina of Time in mind, but it's not built around the concepts of Ocarina of Time, right? right. It, it is so original. And if that's just built onto the world, like you're still booting up Ocarina of Time to get to all this, then you're not living in that world per se. It's just a side dish to the main course versus being its own course on its own. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm, I've, I was torn on this because I was going to bring up the DLC concept, but I was going to be like, well... We're living in an era where maybe we don't need the games to come out faster anymore because now we can just release more substantial DLC. Mm -hmm. But yes, when I, the more exactly. the more I think about it, I would rather have another Majora's Mask than DLC. 
<laughs> right? And like I said, wouldn't you? I, I'd, I'd rather have another uh, spirit track concept that they introduce. It's radically different from any other Zelda game. Yeah, like yeah. like it's... I'll give you an example. I hated Phantom Hourglass, but I love Spirit Tracks. Same yeah. art style, same engine. Completely love one game, completely hate the other. Right. And I I don't hate Breath of the Wild. So like imagine how they could perfect what's already there in a new game concept in a new land away from where Hyrule is right now with a new enemy uh, mm-hmm. and using the limitations of a shorter dev period to introduce... Like, Arlo brought this up himself. One of the reasons that made Majora's Mask so special is that it was a new land that wasn't Hyrule, which was had, like, never happened before. Uh, and because of the short dev time and not being Hyrule, they couldn't use Ganon, so they had to come up with their own unique concept, and that's where the time stuff came from in Majora's Mask and the story about the you know Skull Kid and the Four Giants and how touching, how deep that is. And Zelda's mm-hmm. never been known as having like this big, touching, deep story. Mm-hmm. It's always been kind of the same kind of tale retold in a different way. Mm-hmm. Um, even when right. the enemy isn't Ganon, it's still someone trying to revive him or someone related right. to him in some way. Or right. like in Spirit Trek's Maladus, I, I know he's his own character, but I'm sorry, he literally looks like Ganon. So I <laughs> He's pretty much Ganon light, I guess. I, I, um, I was gonna say it earlier that you know when you, they reintroduced players or characters, they, they would have been hilarious if the first time you interacted with them, they all had Mario mustaches on. <laughs> so it's I'm not the same character, quote unquote. Oh my gosh! No, that means the where's the cap? Mario yeah, took yeah, over the character. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah um, right. So I'm, I'm I am torn because I love DLC when it's done right. Right. And I don't know that it's been done right in Breath of the Wild yet. Because I firmly believe Master Mode should not have been locked behind a paywall. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like even if it wasn't done at launch, it should have been free update. Because it, it's a difficulty setting. Mm-hmm. I don't feel like players mm-hmm. should have to pay money for difficulty setting. Right. And it's the one reason I did not like the double damage with Ganon. It's the only amiibo that did something uh, besides, well, I guess Wolf Link and Link giving, Wolf Link adding Wolf Link to the game, giving players an advantage, and Epona. Uh, but the double damage one really bothered me because here you're actively saying we can make our game harder. It's already there, but you need an amiibo to unlock that hard mode. Mm-hmm. So you not only to to put this in perspective, to get the hardest possible mode in Breath of the Wild, you need to buy the Ganondorf amiibo, mm-hmm. and you need to spend twenty dollars on a twin pack of DLC. Mm-hmm. That's how Although, you get the hardest mode possible to play in Breath of the Wild. Although uh, Zelda players already have their own. Uh, They've yeah. been playing for years. Obviously. Just, you know, don't expand your heart containers. And in Breath <laughs> of the armor. Wild, don't upgrade your armor. Don't do any cooking. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. yeah. yeah but, but that's but that's all self-created within the systems of a game, right? Uh, Nintendo, you could do that, okay? But now do that with Master Mode and double damage with the Ganondorf Amiibo. Right. That was all done with what was given to you. Yeah. It's not... It, it, it was, didn't need anything added to it to make yes. that difficulty appear. Yeah, Mm -hmm. and that's, I've never agreed with that. So it all depends on how they approach a DLC thing. Because I would be okay if it's done in the right way. But I still keep them back to, man, I want to see them do another Majora's Mask kind of game or another Spirit Tracks. I I would like to see Nintendo for once. What we have to realize is why do games, why do these games generally take five years between them? vastly different art styles Mm -hmm. new engines being built around the game new platforms always coming out mid creation right wild uh yeah they spent like three years perfecting the physics in breath of the wild and it's like okay so if you spent all that time doing it then why only use it in one game Mm -hmm. yep why don't you bring that to another game heck they could do a new art style and keep the same engine right Mm -hmm. you know just tweak it a little bit make it look a little bit different have it be its own flavor but it uses the same mechanics the same engine there's nothing wrong with that Or, or use the same art style in general do dlc or have a Breath of the Wild 2. Have a game that tells a story. You know you know what Breath of the Wild is ripe for, right? It's ripe for a prequel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The events that happened 100 years ago. You could literally build a game around it. It doesn't have to or, be DLC. It, you, it, it can be you know, $20, $40 DLC if they want, or it could be a $60 brand new game. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And like it, it's, it's actually a unique game in that it's set up for a prequel. You could argue that Ocarina of Time kind of was too with the war. Uh, but at the time, no one expected Nintendo to ever go visit a war uh, in a game. But uh, yeah, it's I I feel like fixing Zelda is multifaceted. If Nintendo truly believes in DLC, which it seems like they do, then they don't think they need to increase the time or decrease the time of, of, of game creation. They just need to increase the production of DLC. Uh, and Nintendo's entering an interesting era where there's really only how, how they try to appease fans between 
Twilight Princess uh, and Skyward Sword, or more specifically between Skyward Sword and Breath of the Wild, was the remasters, right? They mm-hmm. remastered their old games. So they only have so many of those. How many got remastered right. between Skyward Sword and <laughs> Breath of the Wild coming out? I mean, how many more years of remasters can they do? You can yeah. argue yeah. three. You can argue Skyward Sword HD, especially yeah. since the Switch has motion control, so now yeah. that, that can be done. Um, mm-hmm. You can argue that they can also bring Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask into HD, which would be their second remasterings, but it would be an mm-hmm. HD version. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, after that, you're just talking about a, a combo pack port of yeah. a Twilight Princess and the Wind Waker. Yeah. Breath of the Wild extra. 4K. Yeah. 4K. Yeah. 4K. Yeah. yeah. Extra high. <laughs> wait. 4K res pack. Yeah. On right. A system yeah. that can't do 4K. Right. Exactly. Uh, no, I mean, I mean, apparently. with extra with extra optimization, maybe they could get it up to 1080p. But once you just yeah. release that as a patch, it, it, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyways, <laughs> I I was just throwing yeah. something out there to be so facetious. I, I view it I view it in, in in that light where Nintendo needs to stop creating something masterful and throwing it away because mm-hmm. they do that a lot. Uh, they created a masterpiece with Breath of the Wild, the yes. absolute master. Is it perfect in every way? Yeah. No, but it's a master. It, it, I don't know many people who have played the game that will say it's not a masterpiece. Exactly. And if you have a masterpiece, you don't just throw all your work away. You build mm-hmm. off of that masterpiece. Mm-hmm. You, you do a Majora's Mask like they did with Ocarina of Time. I'm surprised they didn't right. build a game off of Twilight Princess after how well that sold. Well, but uh, Ocarina of Time was the last time that it was like pretty well unanimous everywhere. This is a masterpiece. Sure, sure. And, I mean, Twilight the Princess had more hype going into so launch, great. but Twilight Princess was very good with the hype train. Um, no, yeah, Twilight with, Princess was a great game, yeah, absolutely, but yeah. it wasn't universally lauded as a masterpiece across critics and fans alike. I'll leave it alone. <laughs> I'll let you have that one. No, no, you're right, you're right. It's a great game. Not, well, yeah, not no, great. we're not arguing the merits of the game, but I remember right. back then mm-hmm. it, it kind of. There's this thing called the Zelda cycle. I don't fully believe in it. Yes, I don't um, either. I don't fully believe it's it's really a thing. I just think it the the cycle isn't um, the cycle exists, but it doesn't exist in the way that it's portrayed, where people are changing their opinions all the time. It exists in it where everyone who loves the game plays it, loves it says they love it, and then they're done. And they have no reason to keep talking and praising it. And then that's when the people who don't like it see an avenue to start complaining. Because mm-hmm. um, now their voices can be heard. So the vocal minority, so it always feels like people love the game and they hate it and they love the prior game. I'm like, that's not... People generally either like the game or hate the game in a way their opinions didn't change. Right. Um, so yeah. the Zelda cycle is just about the cycle of consumerism, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Yeah. Uh, fixing Zelda is, again, a matter of Nintendo changing how they choose to develop Zelda games. I mm-hmm. think that every main game, and this is something Arlo brought up, is that every main Zelda game should have a follow-up game using the same engine and the same assets, while at the same time, in the background, they are already working on the engine for the for the next generation of Zelda games. Mm-hmm. And now um, they should be able to do that with uh, combining the portable and home console. Well, yeah, and, and if you think about three three years of development on this, they could have say half of their Zelda team working on that new engine for that mm-hmm. new Zelda game that might not even be here until Switch Two or whatever's next. And then you have the other hundred people. With the engine already built, the art assets already created, building a game within that. And you could end up, and that team, obviously once that game is released, transfers all over to the other game that's already in development. Mm -hmm. And suddenly that team, that by now, three years in, has just finished the engine, now has the extra 100 people, plus the help from Monolith, to get the other game out within a two- or three-year window. Mm-hmm. So that game might have actually been in development for six years, but as a consumer, it only you looks like, like a three-year three year gap. Window, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, so it might actually take you even longer to make that next generation, but because there was a game in between, not a remaster, a true new game, consumers are suddenly really, really happy. Uh, yeah. And with how much hype Breath of the Wild has, why would you not take advantage of that right now? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think because it is a launch game, there will absolutely be another Switch Zelda main console game. We I hope. mean, we saw that with Twilight Princess and we Skyward can only Sword. Hope. We can only hope. I'm not get, after what happened with Breath of the Wild. I am not. 
I don't feel as confident that Nintendo's going to do what we hope they're going to do. Either with a really, really, really huge DLC pack for 40 bucks or something, or with a brand new game. I am not confident. Because they, they need to earn after... We just came off a generation of hardware where there was no exclusives of the game. Yeah. First time it's ever happened. Wii U did yeah. not have its own exclusive game because it also released on Switch at the same time. And yes, we're not talking about games being ported. That happens, but mm-hmm. but that game still represents that. Like even today, you get Ocarina of Time 3D. That game is still thought of as an N64 game. Mm-hmm. What right. is Switch? Is it a Wii U game? Or I'm sorry, was Breath of the Wild a Switch game or is it a Wii U game? It's being viewed as a Switch game, but it spent most of its development on Wii U. Mm-hmm. But it released at the same time. Switch so a little more version. Princess. Same with Twilight Princess. Is it a Wii game or is it a GameCube game? Now I personally know it's a GameCube game. I know Breath mm-hmm. of the Wild is a Wii U game, but publicly, consumer wise. It's a Wii game. It's a Switch game. Mm -hmm. But is it? Because they might also know in the back of their minds, but it also released on this other platform at the same time. Mm -hmm. There's this confusion, and and that confusion isn't necessarily bad for the sales of a game, but it's bad in the sense of trying to figure out what generation that game belongs to Mm -hmm. and what generation of hardware, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Right. So Switch, Mm -hmm. got Breath of the Wild, is doing fantastic, but, you know, Wii U didn't get its own exclusive game to define that generation. Uh, by the t- if it takes five, six years for the next Zelda game, and this is why we're talking about this, if it takes them five or six years, it's very possible we're already talking about the next generation of Switch. Right. Um, you know, with the next two in it, or we're talking about whatever Nintendo does next after Switch. Uh, and that's what the Zelda game, even, even if it was developed for Switch, it starts getting to the end of the lifespan. And this happened with, I mean, you think about Skyward Sword, it came out a year before the Wii was done. Mm-hmm. Um, and by and large, that was a terrible decision. It might have even affected the sales of the game because it came out at a time when people were getting over the Wii, people were looking forward to the Wii U, and then over oh, dropping a big Zelda game, you know, right in the middle of everyone not wanting to touch Wii anymore. <laughs> um, so in hindsight, maybe it should have been pushed to a Wii U launch game. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe, but at the same time, the Wii was, you know, their most popular home console ever. And suddenly they had no games for it except Zelda. You know, well, yeah, were, but it was like no games for that like two whole years. console. It was so bad. The, the, they were leaving all these fans on the hook, and then high and dry with nothing. Mm-hmm. It they had was to not, do something. Yeah, but that something to me isn't really seen one of your highest budgeted, biggest IPs in the middle of a massive game drought. That to me is sending a game out to die. This is like. There was no games for Switch all year, not even Breath of the Wild at launch. The, the biggest launch game was Snipper Clips, and we don't get a big game until Mario Odyssey, and no one wants to buy a Switch because there's nothing to play on it, and the Mario Odyssey comes out. Mm-hmm. It would affect Mario Odyssey sales. There wouldn't be as many Switches on the market. Mm-hmm. Uh, there wouldn't be as many people caring. They're just like, oh, so Nintendo's got one big game, and then, oh, we've got to wait a whole year for their next big game. And that's what's so great about Switch is it's not like that. We, yeah, it, started with, it started with Zelda. The first year's ending with Mario, and in between we're getting Splatoon and ARMS and Skyrim and Minecraft. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, We're getting Resident Evil Revelations now, NBA. Like They actually have a, a pretty nice lineup here. Um, and when Skyward Sword came out, man, it was like nothing in 2010, nothing in 2011. We were begging for ports from Japan in 2011. Oh man, Operation then, Rainfall brings you know Blade Chronicles to the U.S. Yeah, it, oh, it's there, man. Yeah, it, it it's a it's a time period that uh, I feel like was a, not a good time to release a game that they spent so much time and money on. Even if, because the thing with Skyward Sword is. It was always supposed to be, at least it it was kind of hyped up by fans to be, the game that proved motion controls can be put into a serious game. But the problem was by the time it came out, everyone was done with Wii. The the time to prove that concept had passed. Yep, like the Wii U. They never really got around to fully proving that system out either. I don't think... And that... that's what they've done right with the Switch is right away yeah. they said... Here's everything it does well, and every game from now on takes advantage of like every aspect of it. Well, what's interesting awesome. with the Switch and Wii U is the Wii U was largely an idea of Iwata, Miyamoto, etc. Um, mm-hmm. Nintendo's old guard. And mm-hmm. if while we don't know this officially, we can almost tell by how the games acted, like how they performed, how they how they took advantage or didn't take advantage of the gamepad that there was a disconnect between what the high-up execs thought was a great idea and what the developers actually wanted to make. 
Mm -hmm. uh, because so many of the ideas, oh yeah, we threw a mini map on there. That, okay, everyone knew that. Yeah. And everyone yeah. and, and there's and, and there's DS and 3DS and, for well, a long and, there, time. and there's tangible evidence in the case of the gamepad that's not as good as the DS and 3DS because you do have to completely take your eyes off the TV to see the map. And if you yeah. have to do that in the first place, then what, what's that? What's the difference between that and an overlay? Yeah, there, there isn't a difference because either way you take your, your eyeballs off the game. The only game that really took Zombie advantage Wars. of it was Zombie U. I mean, I, I know some people yeah. bring up some other examples, but to me, Zombie U is the epitome of some of the potential it had. I also think it had high potential for asynchronous gaming that Nintendo advertised at the beginning of Nintendo Land but never took advantage of. So yeah. there was a big disconnect. With Switch, Miyamoto was not involved with the development. Uwada was, but he was CEO when it, when it was first being conceptualized. Mm -hmm. um, and by and large, it's been reported that it was Nintendo's younger team that came up with the concept, came up with the ideas behind it. And those younger people are also the ones that are starting to get bigger leadership roles inside Nintendo. They're the ones that came up with ARMS. They're the ones that Splatoon. came up with Splatoon. Um, games that have been critically successful. Uh, and, I mean, I don't know how you could expect otherwise. ARMS is made by the Mario Kart team. Come on. The Mario Kart team's excellent. It, yeah. It's not like the whatever team they have on Mario Party and Mario Tennis that just spits out crap. We're talking about a team that is like the epitome of excellence at Nintendo. Started uh, out yeah. good and then just went. And, and actually, this was something that I talked about on my stream recently. That one day we're we're gonna lose Shigeru Miyamoto. I mean, he's gonna retire. You know, he's not gonna be involved anymore. And uh, people always bring up, oh, I don't want another mother game because. Uh, Etoy says he's not going to make one, and if he's not making it, then it can't be any good. And that's not true, right? Because we're looking at Splatoon and we're looking at Arms, and one day Miyamoto's not going to be there, and that doesn't good when Miyamoto's gone. He's made a great foundation. People follow his footsteps. New ideas come in that he didn't have, mm -hmm. and uh, it's going to be fine. It really is. I think a lot of it. Uh, I, I disagree on the mother aspect just because. That game has not been around for so long that any ideas that young developers have should just be put into a new IP. Whereas, well, like something, something like fresh Mario, is a good thing. yeah, but but something like Mario and Zelda, like those games, have have had the time to be passed down, right? First, it was passed for, like Zelda was passed from uh, you know Miyamoto down to Eiji Anomo, and then he'll eventually pass it on to Fubayashi or whoever the, whoever is next in line. Um, at the company mm -hmm. coming up in Zelda. And that's like a passing of the torch. Whereas, because yeah. Mother hasn't been around for so long, there hasn't been a pa there hasn't been that you got to be in on the development of these games to understand the core of what makes mm -hmm. a Mother game a Mother mm -hmm. game. Sure, so but... At this at point, you bring in a fresh new developer on it who had who might not even been alive when these games came out. I mean, but that's maybe the he loved and played the crap out of them. He could have, but he wasn't there at the development level to understand yeah, what made but, it okay, that. Yeah, but okay, but totally, as like I'm me, playing like, through these games okay. on my stream, there's a huge difference between Mother 2 and 3. Huge. There is, there is. Totally in everything. Big so difference between I, Zelda 1 and Zelda 2. <laughs> exactly. So I, I, I honestly don't see any problem moving forward with Mother. It has a huge cult following right now, and I think it's absolutely fine to say... Somebody else out there can have a good idea for this series, and they can make the game, and it'll be good. And I hope you are correct. I don't think you are, because it's almost. It's not Do you just think because... anybody else can make a good mother game? I don't get this point of view. No, I, I don't, because wow. they would need in order. I think in order for it to happen, they would need Itoy heavily involved. No, at, at least in, if not at a development level at a feedback and guidance level because this is just like someone this saying, is this is just like fans who think I could go in and make a better Zelda game than Nintendo. Even if you can't develop it, you could, you argue I have better ideas, but you've never well, been involved. An experienced person with video game development at all though. But, it's but, not exactly the same thing. Apples and oranges. Yeah. But you're talking about people who have zero experience developing a mother game, suddenly being able to make an awesome mother game. Okay, but okay, how about this? Retro, zero experience making a first person Metroid game is amazing. You know what I mean? New ideas. But they are also okay, had, and they can revitalize. But a they series. also had the founder of Metroid guiding them while they were making it. That wasn't just cool. retro do whatever you want. That was the people behind Metroid lording you know, like the development of Metroid Prime had severe overlap with Nintendo of Japan. They were sure. constantly hawking. What about Thomas game. Happ with uh, uh, his his Metroid-like game? I forget. Uh, Axiom Verge. 
Everyone seems to love Axiom Verge. One dude all on his own. Yeah, but it's not Metroid. You're proving no, but it could have been. Pro- but it could have been easily been a Metroid you, game. You can right? say that, but is it not better off as its own thing without its, without the restrictions of the of the Metroid franchise? Why it's would there own... have to be restrictions? Fresh ideas. You know what I mean? Well, because you're building within the universe of the game. Unless you want well, to reboot the whole series. a new part of the universe. Yeah. I don't know. Like, I think Fusion Axiom Verge is, is a fantastic it took game. things in a totally different direction too, you know? And that was supposedly four. I'd love to see where five would go based off of where Fusion started. Sure. You know what I mean? Like there's brave think, new directions games can go. Yeah. And this is just where we're at a crossroads because I think if you're going to have these all these brand new ideas coming in, Nintendo actually falls into this trap a lot. They force their new ideas onto IP when they could easily be put into a new game. I mean, Splatoon originally had Mario shooting the paint. Okay? Right, it was going to be a Mario like. shooting game. And Nintendo or someone finally made the decision, no, take Mario out. Like, actually make it a new thing. Um, and that was, like, finally someone removed the handcuffs off the developers having to tie these new ideas to IP. If you have all these fresh ideas from Mother, just make a new IP with it. Axiom Verge is fantastic on its own. It doesn't need to be Metroid. It can stand out on its own. You have to build a new fan base. So, we're talking about Nintendo. They just did it with Splatoon and ARMS. If it's similar enough, I don't think it'd be that You know how many people thought ARMS was just a punch-out rip-off? No. It's not. It's completely its own thing. I still don't see why it couldn't be a mother game, though. Honestly. Because I feel like when you are... Look at all the franchises that have had long, huge breaks from when a game released to when a new game and that IP comes out and that made with a completely new team with none of the original members involved in it. Oftentimes, oftentimes, the game falls on its face. And the big, what's the big criticism about Kid Icarus Uprising? It doesn't feel like a Kid Icarus game. It feels right. like they forced... Uh, the, the biggest criticism of it is, is it feels like they forced Kid Icarus into a game that is not Kid Icarus. Well, that or, you know, there was a 25-year gap and it, gameplay game. changed a little bit in that amount of time. Well, you, you talked about Kid Icarus was a platformer, and this was no longer a platformer. This was more like Fantasy Star than a Kid Icarus game. Fantasy Star? Yeah, go, go, go play some Fantasy Star. <laughs> There's also a... Uh, which Fantasy Star are you talking about? Like Fantasy Star Online? Because I'm thinking Fantasy Star 1 through 4, and I'm like, it doesn't Oh, no, me Fantasy Star Online. And then also that other game they released on Wii, what was it, uh... First time they had released a game for it in a while. I'm trying to remember where you had to point the thing at the screen and shoot things. Um, God, Fantasy like every, Star, every like Light Gun game Gallery game? game? No, 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 no. It's not a Fantasy Star game. I can't, I'm really drawing a blank. It's such a great game that no <laughs> one played. Literally, no one played, but it's so fantastic. I can't remember now. I'm gonna have to look it up after the podcast. Um, maybe I'll let the editor know so he can like flash it on the screen quick what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, to me, the Kid Icarus game felt a lot like whatever game that is. Um, and Kid Icarus Uprising, I love that game. Love, love, love that game. But the whole time I play in it, I'm like, this isn't Kid Icarus. And that's, I think, what you run into with a, with a that's series. Okay. But that's what happens when you run into a series that has such a cult following. They expect a certain thing. If you give them something that's not that, that cult following isn't playing that game. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. Like, if they just made, like... Nintendo Kart and it was uh, new characters and it wasn't Mario and that you know what I mean if it was uh, Nintendo Golf and it wasn't Mario you know I don't know that it necessarily has a huge impact one way or the other if it was more of a success without Mario in it or more of a success with Mario in it you know what I mean like it I think it's okay but I don't know if we'll ever actually see it happen. Well, yeah, I mean, other we need Mother point. 3 to come to the West before we can even talk about a Mother 4 anyways. I'm, I'm feeling it, though. The Reggie's comments leave me hopeful. He's been making teasies like this for like 20 years. No, 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 no. This year, uh, I know, early in the very, year, he had made a very specific that, comment this year. Hey, if, uh, if you don't hear anything by the end of the year, talk. Yeah, I, I have a feeling it was something they were... I was surprised that they didn't do it. They didn't do something like put it on the NES or SNES Classic. I was very surprised they didn't do that. They put Earthbound on there, so that's. Something. I know. I was surprised they didn't start. do Mother Three because that would have just like Star Fox Two would have like everyone would have bought it. Yeah, um, but it was a GBA game, so it didn't quite fit the theme. Yeah, well, they could make it work, or maybe <laughs> you're right. They could. They, they could do anything. Totally they, right. They're Nintendo. They can do anything. They SNES want. Classic. Play Game Boys on your SNES. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. Hello, yeah, you could. Ga- the Game Boy Advance or Super like Game Boy, Boy. Game Super Boy. Game Boy, yeah, yeah. The Game Boy Advance games, just yeah. Game Boy. Yeah, Game they, Boy they just have a Super. Yeah, Game they Boy. were just instead of releasing like a Game Boy Color or whatever classic, they can just have the Super well, yeah. Super Game Boy. Yeah, exactly. They yeah. Game, Game Boy Classic, classic that plays all three it, generations. You're right. What do you mean? How would a Game Boy Classic work? I, I, you know how hard, you know how hard it would be to release yeah. to release a smaller, slimmer, sleeker version of the original Game Boy and just pack on a whole bunch of games on it. That would sell. I'm like thinking like, like the GBA color. style yes. yeah. form. Yeah, but factor. it doesn't come with games. Like, Basically, this is a all... tiny switch that yeah. only plays yeah. retro games. Yeah, yeah. But anyways, <laughs> obviously, we're just gonna have to agree to disagree. Um, and again, like my evidence for that is, look what happened with Arms and Splatoon. I think infinitely better than making Arms into another Punch Out game. Or making Splatoon into another Mario spinoff game. And I realized maybe it would have sold more if it was a Mario spinoff game. I don't know. Mario Kart obviously sold more. Mario Party sold more at the time. But I think we can agree that Splatoon 2 is fantastic. Splatoon is a fantastic mm-hmm. IP. Um, ARMS at least feels fantastic. I mean, whether or not that becomes a, a franchise, we don't know yet. Because it's just been the first game. But what we know is that, at least what we've seen, is that when Nintendo is letting their new talent do things, they don't like, like, instead of putting the handcuffs of an established IP, let them do what they want. Now, if they want, if the young generation wants to make a mother four, then I'm, I'm with you. Right. But I, I think, think it's I think if they, I, think, I just don't, I don't want to think that Nintendo is saying you can't do it. You know, I'd like to think if somebody at Nintendo said, I have a great idea for mother four, and I really think that it's going to fit tonally perfectly well. I would love to think that somebody at Nintendo says, Tell me about it. Let, let's see if I if you can convince me. Instead of saying no, hands off, don't touch. I think Nintendo's just gonna say no, hands off, don't touch. I think Nintendo's it's gonna instead, not necessary. because I bet I bet you they're I bet you they won't be willing to do it unless iToy signs off on it, and I don't think iToy is gonna sign off on it. The the only reason why I definitely agree with that point is because it is so much his child. Yeah. His name is literally on the front of every cart that is an, it, it, a mother game. It is game, like his which defini- isn't even true of Mario, him. right? It's not like Mario, a Shigeru Miyamoto game. You yeah. know, yeah. That's the only reason I would agree with you. It is so uh, yeah. much. I mean, I Nintendo can do it without property. his permission, but I think I think they respect him too much to let one get made unless he approves it. And here's the thing. If he approves it, you think he's going to do it without being involved? Yeah. There's no way. Yeah. For, for a series for a series not. that he, you just admitted, is so tied to his name. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that case, yeah, a mother four could get made. But it's because he wants it to get made. And right now he keeps saying he doesn't want it to be made. And as long as he yeah, has that stance, I don't think it's going to You have happen. my blessing. That's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> put it in his will. <laughs> oh, that's sad. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying I don't want Mother Four. For, obviously, soon. obviously, I want Mother Three in English officially first. But uh, totally. But yeah, it's I like what Nintendo is doing now, and while I love Nintendo's old generation, I want another F Zero game. I, I want so many oh of these my old gosh. games to come back. At the same time, I really like what Nintendo's new generation developers are doing. When Nintendo's like, "Hey, you don't have to make a Mario game. You don't have to make a Zelda. You can make your own idea, your own game." This is what Nintendo used to be. Mm-hmm. Pikmin. Think, you know, that was think, a great example well, of a new. Well, Irish Shigeru one. Miyamoto. That was his idea. So I, I know, but it was a new IP. It, it wasn't was like, IP, yeah. hey, let's make it a Kirby game. Well, it, which is a little bit like Shigeru maybe Miyamoto. Mass by Attack. the time Pikmin came out, could do anything he wants. <laughs> <laughs> let's yeah. be honest. He had, he wanted to make any kind of game he could. He, Miyamoto has probably never been restricted by a franchise on his ideas. Yeah. I mean, we music happened. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> it sure they pretty did. much let Miyamoto do whatever he wants. I mean, Star yeah. Fox Zero is a more recent example. You know, his, uh, his excuse that there can't be a Star Fox game unless we can do something new with it, when all everybody wanted was more of the same. Actually, and, I felt uh, Star Fox Guard was much more interesting and looked like a way better sure, game to me. Sure, And I'm excited for Star Fox 2. But, uh, yes. yeah, I think, yes. you know... I think that Nintendo is doing really good letting their new developers do their own thing, which to me feels like Nintendo growing up. Do you remember when you were a kid, it always felt like there was some new idea, some new IP coming out of Nintendo. Something fresh. Yes, you had your Marios and your Zeldas and your Metroids, but that wasn't all you got. And then for a while here, it felt like, well, that's all we're getting. Yeah. 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 And now it's back to, well, last gen was Splatoon, this gen's arms. There's probably going to be even more fresh ideas mm-hmm. coming because they have, they literally have stated they have an entire team dedicated to just making new IP at this point, <laughs> which is Great. awesome. 
Um, and mm-hmm. I, I hope this continues. And I, I mean, I want to be wrong, and I want Mother Four to happen. I don't want people to feel like I don't That's want Mother right. Four. Of course, I want Mother Four. Who, That's right. You'd have to be like, <laughs> I, maybe you just really hate the Mother series. You don't care. But then, why would you care if Mother Four happens? Well, like it affects your life. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's you know, you look at the grand scheme of things, and I'm really happy with how the Switch is doing with games. And I hope you know, getting mm-hmm. back to that Zelda topic, that this does lead Nintendo to realize, hey, look. For us to keep a steady stream of games going, we can't be taking five years with every Mario, with every, you know, on 3D Mario, every 3D Zelda. You know, we need a Galaxy 2. We need a Majora's Mask. Mm -hmm. We need Mm -hmm. games that perfect on the formula and do something new with it Mm -hmm. in the same franchise. Uh, In addition to their new IPs and their new ideas and even the remasters and the re-release of Wii U games. We need Bayonetta 3. We need you to reach out to Platinum and be like, look... You pour Bayonetta 1 and 2, and by the way, we'll pay you for Bayonetta 3 because now yeah. we have a platform that's yeah. even more popular. Mm-hmm. Oh, hey, and I'll and finally we... get to play a wonderful 101. A wonderful 101, was... right? Yeah. That on Wii U. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not someone like, there's a lot of Wii U owners that have been like, oh, who, why am I wanting to switch? It's just rehashing games I already own. Hey, that's fine. They don't buy one. Yeah. But like, you are missing out on the fact that there's so many people that want to switch and never played Wii U. Why yep. should they not be allowed to play these games that Nintendo spent a lot of money on that are high quality? Yeah, mm-hmm. and and for a reminder, the like Wii U sold released. worse than the PS Vita. And so it's not like swallow that, that pill. <laughs> well, PS Vita sold well in Japan, so. Yeah, but Relative. anywhere else? No, I don't think yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think. I'm like, how much bad how enough you, that how Sony was is, uh, like one year in. They were like, you remember done. how much? How, how, yeah, how was the total? At it. We're done with this thing. What was the lifetime total on the Vita? I keep thinking it was like thirty million, but I can't remember. One is, yeah, I can look it up quick. I'm, I'm I'm just actually curious if it if it because I I think it might have topped GameCube as well. Oh yeah, that'd be interesting. The huh? granted, GameCube and Wii U are obviously the worst selling home consoles of all time, not counting Virtual Boy. Um, I don't think anyone comes Virtual Boy, do they? I mean, is it even a home console when you got to well, put it on a, a stand and console. hold it to your eyeballs yeah. with a tripod? <laughs> it's a portable. Is it, is, it really, is it really a portable when you need a tripod to play it? It's battery powered. It's Wouldn't it just be the precursor to the Oculus or something? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was supposed to be 3D, remember? 3D yeah. that burns your retina. Right. Oh man, I'm not seeing any. Official... You're not seeing the official numbers. Well, <laughs> because they didn't want official numbers. That's how bad they it was. Post it. Yeah. Well, we only sold three million. Uh, no, they sold more than three million. I know it well, was doing well in Japan. This says there was an estimate in 2015 December that there was about 12.5 million units okay. sold, but so that was two be, years ago. Yeah, maybe so... they creeped up to 15 or 20. Yeah, exactly. Because I know they had some games in Japan. I remember watching those charts. They, there were some PS Vita games that were doing really well in Japan. Mm-hmm. Um, and they even had Monster Hunter for a little bit. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and PSP, obviously, that was a huge success. I know everyone's like, oh, yeah. but DS was 150. I'm like, dude, PSP sold Game Boy numbers. Come on now. Can't say yeah, that wasn't it successful. It sold really well. Yeah. Like that, 80 million? Yeah. Come on now. Yeah. Come on. It was Child, actually please. kind they of wish 3DS uh, and, criminally and unfortunate for million. Sony. Yeah. The DS was such a huge hit because the PSP was a really big hit as well. Just <laughs> not next to that megalith. Well, it's just yeah. like, oh, well, we won the generation with 100 million. I'm like, yeah, but it wasn't like it sucked for Sony and Microsoft. They sold 80 million. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's not like, oh my God, they had such a terrible time. Just you, right. you, you sold faster, but long haul, kind of all equal out. It's all right. Um, anyways, I think that's going to do it for this week's Nintendo Prime podcast. Uh, as always, you can follow us on social media. Uh, Facebook.com slash Nintendo Prime will take you to our Facebook page at Ninty Prime, N I T Y. Uh, that's Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter at Nate Jance. Yeah, you can follow 5G Gaming on Twitter. What's your Twitter handle again? Yeah, so my Twitter is just at 5J, F I V E J A Y. You can also check me out on YouTube at youtube.com slash 5J Gaming and on Twitch at twitch.tv slash 5J. And almost every weekend uh, right here on the YouTube channel, you'll be able to see 5J streaming something. Uh, he's already building up himself a little following here. That's cool. I'm glad people like like seeing you here. I like having you on the podcast. Good mm-hmm. times. Yeah. Like, even though we just ended with a disagreement, that's good. Yeah. That's what drives conversation. Yeah. Like, like the, see, folks, you can have disagreements with people and not hate each other. It's okay. We're, right. we're not like <laughs> the example in Ted uh, Ted of Fox News. Do we, do we really agree on this? No, or do we really disagree on this? No, no, we agree on absolutely everything. <laughs> <laughs> and as always, I want to thank Eric Moore for being here. He doesn't have any social media following of any kind. 
Although <laughs> in that update video I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, I said when, I, when I, I was like, oh, when people think of Nintendo Prime, I want them to think of me. And then I said, well, unless you think Eric is just a sexy beast, and then I put a picture up of you. Oh, good God. <laughs> I should I, I should do one with your shirt off. I really want to get the ladies. Oh, God. I didn't, do, oh, I didn't go that far. Oh, I'm, like, I'm like, this is public. We're trying not to break PCs here. <laughs> <laughs> in the good kind of way. In well, the good yeah, kind of yeah. way. Because yeah. because you want the screen to crack so that there's see zillions of pictures of you. Right, right. <laughs> Break the internet. I'm not oh trying my to give people heart attacks here. Oh my god, I'm crying so hard my eyes starting to water and itch. And <laughs> I'm just la- I'm having a good time over here. Yeah. All right, folks, uh, we will maybe see you next week. Maybe not. Go ahead and support us over on patreoncom slash Prime. Hey, if we hit that hundred dollar goal before next week, <laughs> there definitely will be one next week for yeah. sure. <laughs> um, and if you would like to be on this podcast, our twenty dollar tier is the way to do it. You support it right now. There, yeah, because this releases on Monday. We record on Thursday, so. Yeah. There will be time between Monday and Thursday for me to get you on the podcast for next week if you would like. So mm-hmm. thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you in the next one. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Peace out. Peace.